Section 84 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seaman. The World Story, Volume 8. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 84. The Search for the Lost Colonies of Greenland. 1579 to 1671. By Dr. Henry Rink. After 1409, the Greenland colonies seem to have been, for many years, utterly neglected, if not entirely forgotten. Some people have supposed that pirates, or the Eskimos, called Skraelings, or the Black Death, had swept away the inhabitants. Others believed that the Danish navigation laws caused the decay of the settlements. Whatever may have been the cause, the colonies disappeared, and no remains of them were found until 1721, the time of Hans Egida, the editor. In 1579 and 1581, the first expeditions were dispatched from Denmark for the rediscovery of Greenland and the resumption of the trade with the inhabitants. It seems to have been a firm belief that people of Norse descent still lived there, but so totally had the knowledge of the colony been neglected that these expeditions only tried to reach the east coast opposite to Iceland. They did not even, like Eric the Red, sail southwards to learn whether the coast might be inhabited there. The pack ice bordering the east coast proved impenetrable. The result of their attempts, consequently, was a total failure, and the rediscovery of the sailing route to the deserted settlements became the achievement of a foreign nation, and the accidental result of explorations undertaken was a very different object in view. It was John Davis who, in the year 1585, in search of the northwest passage around America, discovered the strait named after him, and following the west coast of Greenland, succeeded in landing there in about 64 degrees north latitude, re-entered a fjord, and bartered with the natives. It is a well-known fact that in this and the following voyages, he penetrated into Baffin's Bay to upwards the latitude of our present northmost settlement. Surveying the coasts on both sides, these discoveries in Denmark revived the thought of the long-neglected and given-up settlement, and even led to the opposite extreme in giving rise to the most sanguine expectations. With regard to its significance and riches, in 1605, Christian IV of Denmark sent out three ships under the command of two Englishmen and one Dane, named Lindenau, who were accompanied by one James Hall, who, having been in Greenland before, was appointed pilot, or sailing master. Shortly after they had sighted Greenland, the commanders fell out, and the ships separated, Lindenau succeeding in getting through the ice and finding a harbor somewhere about 62 degrees or 63 degrees north latitude. Here they met with a great number of natives, and began to barter with them for furs and narwhal horns. The natives proved to be very thievish, snatching away everything they could lay hold on, and the Europeans, per contra, availed themselves for the favorable state of the market by giving a single nail, it is told, for wares worth from two to three Danish dollars. Having carried on the traffic for a significantly long time, they secured two of the native merchants themselves, their skin canoes into the bargain, and threw them into the ship's hold, along with the other articles, going for show to Denmark. The two poor wretches fell into a state of fury, so that the crew were obliged to have them tied to the mast, and with gunshots to frighten away their countrymen, were coming out to their rescue. Meanwhile, the other ships had gone much farther north, and landed somewhere south of 67 degrees north latitude. They likewise met with many natives, and commenced bartering with them for skin, whalebone, narwhal horns, and walrus tusks. The commanders of these ships could as little resist the temptation of carrying home some specimens of the human inhabitants in order to exhibit them on their arrival in Europe. After having killed a good many of them, says the old record, they succeeded in capturing four alive, though not without running great risks. The prisoners were so savage and unmanageable 
that the sailors were obliged to shoot one of them to reduce the others to order. On the voyage, however, they grew quite merry, and the captain trained one of them to jump about at a given sign from him when he nodded at them, and to go aloft with the sailors. When these three ships had returned safely to Copenhagen in the same year, they attracted general attention. But of all the wares and curiosities they had carried home with them, nothing created such excitement as some specimens of silver ore, which the voyagers pretended to have discovered at one of the northwest fjords. The king, in the hope of acquiring a lucrative colony, levied a special Greenland tax throughout his dominions, and the next year he equipped no less than five ships for an expedition, chiefly with the aim of mining silver ore. The stolen Greenlanders were appointed interpreters to the explorers, the accounts of this enterprise are not very detailed, but it has been reported that they reached the supposed silver mine, found it all right, shipped full cargo of ore, and bartered with the natives, from whom they stole five. Whereas, in retaliation for other offenses, one of the ship's crew who had been put on shore as punishment for some crime was torn to pieces by the Greenlanders. In October the same year, the expedition returned but as it appears, resulting in utter disappointment. The purchases of Greenland articles had only been few, probably on account of the stores having been exhausted in the preceding year. No further mention is made of any silver mine, and it is supposed that it proved to be only the invention of a swindler, and that those who had been duped quietly put aside the mineral cargo, after having ascertained it to be devoid of any metallic contents. The human specimens were exhibited, and their limbs measured and examined for the purpose of describing this new race. Later on, one of them died of homesickness. Another made a desperate attempt at getting back to Greenland in his kayak, in which he perished. The third of the poor wretches died from being overworked and compelled to go fishing in winter as well as in summer. The last one tried to make his escape, but was overtaken and died of grief and vexation. The result of these explorations have been particularly disappointing as regards the rediscovery of the ancient colonies. Desolate and barren rocks have been found instead of farms and green pastures, and the strange people, of whom a few individuals have been brought home and minutely examined, bore no resemblance at all to the reputed settlers. It has taken centuries to discover the real cause of this disappointment which undoubtedly must be ascribed to an overrating of what Eric the Red considered an inhabitable country. The want of success on the part of the explorers first led to the resumption of the old idea that the abandoned settlements had been situated to the east of Cape Farewell. Thither, the king accordingly, in the following year, 1607, dispatched an expedition which, however, soon returned after several perilous and disastrous efforts to penetrate the belt of pack ice encumbering the whole of the coast. With the failure of this expedition, the government temporarily gave up all further attempts, whereas some private expeditions, English as well as Danish, visited Greenland in the same century, until the government again, in 1670 and 1671, sent out two ships, probably to the east coast, with what result is, however, unknown. These other voyages, in the meantime, gave rise to several commercial undertakings, fishing being tried in the new branch of the Atlantic discovered by John Davis. They were carried on by English, French, and Dutch vessels, and the whale fishery especially acquired a long-continued importance in Davis Strait after the whale had become scarce in the Spitsbergen seas. But only the Dutch seemed to have carried on any traffic with the inhabitants of the Greenland coast. In connection with the whale fishery, this commerce already flourished in the earliest part of the 18th century. The whalers on sailing up and down the strait occasionally dropped in here and there, anchoring up in the bays and awaiting the arrival of the natives who used to bring out the products of their country for sale. Many cairns erected by them, and also many names of places and several traditions indicate that the Dutch have thoroughly searched the coast from Cape Farewell up to 73 degrees north latitude. 
but there are no signs left that any settlements or temporary fishing establishments have ever existed, or been attempted or intended by them, nor have their explorations in any way added to the general store of geographical knowledge. End of section 84. This recording is in the public domain. Section 85 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 8, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 85 the apostle to greenland seventeen twenty one to seventeen thirty six by jacob a rees the norwegian clergyman hans egget could not give up the thought that descendants of the lost colonists of greenland were still living shut away from mankind and from the gospel at length his earnest entreaties prevailed the king of denmark appointed him missionary to the greenlanders and promised him a small salary in may seventeen twenty one he set sail on the ship hobbit the hope for the unknown shores of the land of ice the editor early in june they sighted land but the way to it was barred by impassable ice a whole month they sailed to and fro trying vainly for a passage at last they found an opening and slipped through only to find themselves shut in with towering icebergs closing around them as they looked fearfully out over the rail their convoy signalled that she had struck and the captain of hobbit cried out that all was lost in the tumult of terror that succeeded agate alone remained calm praying for succour where there seemed to be none he remembered the one hundred and seventh psalm he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and brake their bands in sunder and the morning dawned clear the ice was moving and their prison widening on july three hobbit cleared the last ice wreath and the shore lay open before them the eskimos came out in their kayaks and the boldest climbed aboard the ship in one boat sat an old man who refused the invitation he paddled about the vessel mumbling darkly in a strange tongue he was an angakok one of the native medicine men of whom presently agid was to know much more as he stood upon the deck and looked at these strangers for whose salvation he had risked all his heart fell they were not the stalwart northmen he had looked for and their jargon had no home-like sound but a great wave of pity swept over him and the prayer that rose to his lips was for strength to be their friend and their guide to the light not at once did the way open for the coveted friendship with the eskimos while they thought the strangers came only to trade they were hospitable enough but when they saw them build clearly intent on staying they made signs that they had better go they pointed to the sun that sank lower toward the horizon every day and shivered as if from extreme cold and they showed their visitors the icebergs and the snow making them understand that it would cover the house by and by when it all availed nothing and the winter came on they retired into their huts and cut the acquaintance of the white men they were afraid that they had come to take revenge for the harm done their people in the olden time there was nothing for it then but that egid must go to them and this he did they seized their spears when they saw him coming but he made signs that he was their friend when he had nothing else to give them he let them cut the buttons from his coat throughout the fifteen years he spent in greenland egid never wore furs as did the natives the black robe he thought more seemly for a clergyman to his great discomfort he tells in his diary and in his letters that often when he returned from his 
winter travels it could stand alone when he took it off being frozen stiff after a while he got upon neighborly terms with the eskimos but if anything the discomfort was greater they housed him at night in their huts where the filth and the stench were unendurable they showed their special regard by first licking off the piece of seal they put before him and if he rejected it they were hurt their housekeeping of which he got an inside view was embarrassing in its simplicity the dish-washing was done by the dogs licking the kettle clean often after a night or two in a hut that held half a dozen families he was compelled to change his clothes to the skin in an open boat or out on the snow but the alternative was to sleep in a cold that sometimes froze his pillow to the bed and the teacup to the table in his own home above all he must learn their language it proved a difficult task for the eskimo tongue was both very simple and very complex in all the things pertaining to their daily life it was exceedingly complex for instance to catch one kind of fish was expressed by one word to catch another kind in quite different terms they had one word for catching a young seal another for catching an old one when it came to matters of moral and spiritual import the language was poor to desperation Egid's instruction began when he caught the word kine what is it and from that time on he learned every day but the pronunciation was as varied as the work-a-day vocabulary and it was an unending task it proceeded with many interruptions from the anger cocks who tried more than once to bewitch him but finally gave it up convinced that he was a great medicine man himself and therefore invulnerable but before that they tried to foment a regular mutiny the colony being by that time well under way and agate had to arrest and punish the leader the natives naturally clung to them and when agate had mastered their language and tried to make clear that the angakoks deceived them when they said they went to the other world for advice they demurred did you ever see them go he asked well have you seen this god of yours of whom you speak so much was their reply when agate spoke of spiritual gifts they asked for good health and blubber our angakoks give us that hell-fire was much in theological evidence in those days but among the eskimos it was a failure as a deterrent they listened to the account of it eagerly and liked the prospect when at length they became convinced that egged knew more than their angakoks they came to him with the request that he would abolish winter very likely they thought that one who had such knowledge of the hot place ought to have influence enough with the keeper of it to obtain this favor it was not an easy task from any point of view to which he had put his hands as that first winter wore away there were gloomy days and nights and they were not brightened when with the return of the sun no ship arrived from denmark the dutch traders came and opened their eyes wide when they found egged and his household safe and even on friendly terms with the eskimos Pales, the natives called the missionary that as the nearest they could come to the danish prost priest Pales was not there after blubber they told the dutchmen but to teach them about heaven and of him up there who had made them and wanted them home with him again so he had not worked altogether in vain but the brief summer passed and still no relief ship the crew of hobbit clamoured to go home and egged had at last to give a reluctant promise that if no ship came in two weeks he would break up his wife alone refused to take a hand in packing the ship was coming she insisted and at the last moment it did come a boat coming in after dark brought the first word of it the people ashore heard voices speaking danish and flew to egget who had gone to bed with the news the ship brought good cheer the government was well disposed trading and preaching were to go on together as planned joyfully then they built a bigger and a better house and called their colony god thob good hope the work was now fairly under way of the energy and the hardships it entailed even we in our day that has heard so much of arctic exploration 
can have but a faint conception shut in on the coast of eternal ice and silence silence save when in summer the arctic rivers were alive and crash after crash announced that the glaciers coming down from the inland mountains were casting their calves the great icebergs upon the ocean the colonists counted the days from the one when that year's ship was lost to sight till the returning spring brought the next one their only communication with their far-off home in summer the days were sometimes burning hot but the nights always bitterly cold in winter says egged hot water spilled on the table froze as it ran and the meat they cooked was often frozen at the bone when set on the table summer and winter egged was on his travels between sundays sometimes in the trader's boat more often the only white man with one or two eskimo companions seeking out the people when night surprised him with no native hut in sight he pulled the boat on some desert shore and commending his soul to god slept under it once he and his son found an empty hut and slept there in the darkness not until day came again did they know that they had made their bed on the frozen bodies of dead men who had once been the occupants of the house and had died they never knew how peril was everywhere again and again his little craft was wrecked once the house blew down over their heads in one of the dreadful winter storms that ravaged those high latitudes often he had to sit on the rail of his boat and let his numbed feet hang into the sea to restore feeling in them on land he sometimes waded waist-deep in snow climbed mountains and slid down into valleys having but the haziest notion of where he would land at home his brave wife sat alone praying for his safety and listening to every sound that might herald his return tremble and doubt they did egged owns but neither ever flinched their work was before them and neither thought of turning back the natives loved him there came a day that brought this message from the north say to the speaker to come to us to live for the other strangers who come here can only talk to us of blubber 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 and we also would hear of the great creator egged went as far as he could but was compelled by ice and storms to turn back after weeks of incredible hardships the disappointment was the more severe to him because he had never quite given up his hope of finding remnants of the ancient norse settlements the fact that the record spoke of a west bidge settlement and an east bidge had misled many into believing that the desolate east coast had once been colonized not until our own day was this shown to be an error when danish explorers searched that coast for a hundred miles and found no other trace of civilization than a beer bottle left behind by the explorer nordenskjold egged's hope had been that greenland might be once more colonized by christian people when the danish government after some years sent up a handful of soldiers with a major who took the title of governor to give the settlement official character as a trading station they sent with them twenty unofficial christians ten men out of the penitentiary and as many lewd and drunken women from the treadmill who were married by lot before setting sail to give the thing a halfway decent look they were good enough for the eskimos they seemed to have thought at copenhagen there followed a terrible winter during which mutiny and murder were threatened it is a pity writes the missionary that while we sleep secure among the heathen savages among so-called christian people our lives are not safe as a matter of fact they were not for the soldiers joined in the mutiny against egged as the cause of their having to live in such a place and had not sickness and death smitten the malcontents neither he nor the governor would have come safe through the winter on the eskimos this view of the supposed fruits of christian teaching made its own impression after seeing a woman scourged on shipboard for misbehavior they came innocently enough to egged and suggested that some of their best angercocks be sent down to denmark to teach the people to be sober and decent there came a breathing spell after ten years of labor in what had often enough seemed to him the spiritual as well as physical ice barrens of the north 
when egged surveyed a prosperous mission with trade established a hundred and fifty children christened and schooled and many of their elders asking to be baptized in the midst of his rejoicing the summer's ship brought word from denmark that the king was dead and orders from his successor to abandon the station egged might stay with provisions for one year if there was enough left over after fitting out the ship but after that he would receive no further help when the eskimos heard the news they brought their little children to the mission these will not let you go they said and he stayed his wife whom hardship and privation and the lonely waiting for her husband in the long winter nights had at last broken down refused to leave him though she sadly needed the care of a physician a few of the sailors were persuaded to stay another year so now he wrote in his diary when on july thirty one seventeen thirty one he had seen the ship sail away with all his hopes i am left alone with my wife and three children ten sailors and eight eskimos girls and boys who have been with us from the start god let me live to see the blessed day that brings good news once more from home his prayer was heard the next summer brought word that the mission was to be continued partly because egged had strained every nerve to send home much blubber and many skins but it was as a glimpse of the sun from behind dark clouds his greatest trials trod hard upon the good news to rouse interest in the mission egged had sent home young eskimos from time to time three of these died of smallpox in denmark the fourth came home and brought the contagion all unknown to his people it was the summer fishing season when the natives travelled much and far and wherever he went they flocked about him to hear of the great lord's land where the houses were so tall that one could not shoot an arrow over them and to ask a multitude of questions was the king very big had he caught many whales was he strong and a great angakok and much more of the same kind in a week the disease broke out among the children at the mission and soon word came from islands and fjords where the eskimos were fishing of death and misery unspeakable it was virgin soil for the plague and it was terribly virulent striking down young and old in every tent and hut more than two thousand of the natives one-fourth of the whole population died that summer of two hundred families near the mission only thirty were left alive a cry of terror and anguish rose throughout the settlements no one knew what to do in vain did egged implore them to keep their sick apart in fever delirium they ran out in the ice fields or threw themselves into the sea a wild panic seized the survivors and they fled to the farthest tribes carrying the seeds of death with them wherever they went whole villages perished and their dead lay unburied utter desolation settled like a pall over the unhappy land through it all a single ray of hope shone the faith that egged had preached all those years and the life he had lived with them bore their fruit they had struck deeper than he thought they crowded to him all that could as their one friend dying mothers held their suckling babes up to him and died content in a deserted island camp a half-grown girl was found alone with three little children their father was dead when he knew that for him and the baby there was no help he went to a cave and covering himself and the child with skins lay down to die his parting words to his daughter were before you have eaten the two seals and the fish i have laid away for you pallas will come no doubt and take you home for he loves you and will take care of you at the mission every nook and cranny was filled with the sick and dying egged and his wife nursed them day and night childlike when death approached they tried to put on their best clothes or even to have new ones made that they might please god by coming into his presence looking nice when egged had closed their eyes he carried the dead in his arms to the vestibule where in the morning the men who dug the graves found them at the sight of his suffering the scoffers were dumb what his preaching had not done to win them over his sorrows did they were at last won that dreadful year left egged a broken man 
in his dark moments he reproached himself with having brought only misery to those he had come to help and serve one thorn which would think he might have been spared rankled deep in it all some missionaries of a dissenting sect egged was lutheran had come with the small pox ship to set up an establishment of their own at their head was a man full of misdirected zeal and quite devoid of common sense who engaged egged in a wordy dispute about justification by faith and condemned him and his work unsparingly he had grave doubts whether he was in truth a converted man it came to an end when they themselves fell ill and egged and his wife had the last word after their own fashion they nursed the warlike brethren through their illness with loving ministrations and gave them back to life let us hope wiser and better men at christmas seventeen thirty five egged's faithful wife gertrude closed her eyes she had gone out with him from home and kin to a hard and heathen land and she had been his loyal helpmeet in all his trials now it was all over that winter scurvy laid him upon a bed of pain and lying there his heart turned to the old home his son had come from copenhagen to help happily yet while his mother lived to him he would give over the work in denmark he could do more for it than in greenland now he was alone on july twenty ninth seventeen thirty six he preached for the last time to his people and baptized a little eskimo to whom they gave his name hans the following week he sailed for home carrying as all his earthly wealth his beloved dead and his motherless children the eskimos gathered on the shore and wept as the ship bore their friend away they never saw him again he lived in denmark eighteen years training young men to teach the eskimos they gave him the title of bishop but so little to live on that he was forced in his last days to move from copenhagen to a country town to make both ends meet his grave was forgotten by the generation that came after him no one knows now where it is but in ice-girt greenland where the northern lights on wintry nights flash to the natives their message from the souls that have gone home his memory will live when that of the north pole seeker whom the world applauds is long forgotten hans egged was their great man their hero he was more he was their friend end of section eighty five this recording is in the public domain section eighty six of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume eight norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles edited by eva march tappan section eighty six a model parliament by dr isaac i hayes now these greenlanders or eskimos are not prone to be governed yet the danish rule is satisfactory to them and they submit to it without a murmur and none the less readily that they have a voice in their own affairs each little town or hunting station is at liberty to send up a representative to sit in the parliament of juliana schab the number of representatives is twelve the names of the most important towns besides the capital are nenortalik fredericksdal lichtenau these two latter are missions of the moravian brethren ingaliko and kroksimut the parliament house is not an imposing edifice i should say its dimensions are about sixteen by twenty feet it is one story high is built of boards lined on the inside and painted blue and on the outside is plastered over with pitch it has no lobby for the accommodation of people who come to the capital with axes for the public grindstone nor committee rooms for the better confusion of the public business 
in the centre of the one room there stands a long table of plain pine boards and along either side there is one long bench of the same material and on each bench sit six parliamentarians dressed in sealskin pantaloons and boots and guernsey frocks with broad suspenders across their shoulders the faces of these parliamentarians are all of a very dusky hue the colour of their hair is very black and it does not seem to have any greater familiarity with combs and brushes than their faces with soap and towels however they are an amiable-looking party at least they grin and show their fine white teeth when i enter and are altogether perhaps quite clean enough for ordinary parliamentary work every man of them has a pencil in his hand and a piece of paper on the table before him and each one is as busy taking notes thereon as some of our own honourable members are said to be in taking notes of another description but i must not neglect to mention one article of the parliamentary costume for it shines out so conspicuously that it must be noticed i mean the official cap always worn when the house is in session which is supplied to each member by royal bounty this cap is of the brightest kind of scarlet cloth with a broad gilt band around it the royal emblems are emblazoned in front and above these there is a golden polar bear with a crown on his head standing uncomfortably on his hind legs to typify greenland there is a thirteenth cap at the head of the table and this thirteenth cap covers the head of the genial mr anthon pastor of juliana shab and president of the juliana shab parliament ex officio the aggregate amount of dignity possessed by this parliament was quite wonderful and was in truth as overwhelming as the fishy odour with which it was impregnated but neither the fishy odour nor the dignity appeared to interfere with the transaction of business on the contrary they seemed to be working away like beavers and indeed they disposed of matters with such an amazing degree of promptness that i fell instantly to wondering whether dignity would not be a good thing to introduce into parliaments congresses assemblies and such like things generally and as to the fishy atmosphere i have no doubt that it was quite as wholesome as the atmosphere of some of our own legislative halls where lobbyists are so thick about the doors and avenues that all the purity which ever does go in is soon done for of the kind of business brought before this dignified tribunal i will give a few samples the first was a petition for relief the petitioner himself stood there in person looking the very picture of forlorn destitution he stated that he had lost his canoe kayak and he produced evidence enough to show without any swearing false or otherwise that it had been crushed and lost in the ice the man who had hardly clothes on his back to cover his nakedness showed further that he had a wife and family who had no friends to assist them and were entirely dependent upon himself for support i thought it a doubtful support at best and so appeared to think the parliament since they voted an order for a small stipend of food and clothing as per schedule to be drawn from the public storehouse and paid for out of the parliamentary funds the man was sent to work in the government blubber house at twenty-two skillings eleven cents a day the next case was similar in character only the petitioner was a well-known young hunter who had lost his kayak by a fearful accident which had nearly cost him his life as well as boat 
and from the effects of which he had barely now recovered all that i could comprehend was that some of his ribs had been stove in the case being proven the question before parliament was whether they should grant him relief which was unanimously voted in the affirmative how much was the next question after thirteen pencils had ciphered for a minute or so they made it out fourteen dollars seven american for material for the kayak four dollars for harpoon spear etc and six to pay debts contracted at the government storehouse for necessary comforts during his sickness a third case was that of an old man who received one dollar to buy a spear with another was from a man who had a family of girls and no umiak he received twenty-four dollars one half of which he was to refund within two years one hunter got a rifle on the same terms a sick woman obtained some flannel for a shirt some orphan children an order for bread a widow the means to bury her dead husband these and a number more of similar character were soon disposed of some of the cases were represented by proxy the applicant residing at nenortalik or other distant outpost whence to come would be difficult others presented their petitions in person some appeals were thrown out in part or altogether but these were very few for public opinion is strong in greenland and a lofty sense of pride prevents begging except in the last extremity in the case however of the kayak and the umiak there was presented a prospect of future public advantage for in encouraging these people by providing them with boats the public revenues are increased by their adding to the public industry thus do we see that as village hamptons and mute inglorious miltons may sometimes lie in the village churchyard so savage legislators and lawgivers may be solons and adam smiths all in one and they not know anything about it and the world be none the wiser and thus we see these greenland parliaments serve an excellent purpose they take care of the poor they render assistance to the unfortunate they provide certain means of punishing the indolent and guilty they reward the industrious and when they have finished with their business they adjourn and go home to do their talking and what more do you want with a parliament nobody certainly would desire them to vote away millions of acres of the public lands for although they might very well do so without injury to anybody there are no dangerous corporations to be benefited thereby and no public interests to be sacrificed by such procedure and therefore no motive End of section eighty six this recording is in the public domain section eighty seven of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles read for librivox dot org by Avahi. greenland part two stories of life in greenland historical note save for the island continent australia greenland is the largest island in the world three-fifths of the land is covered with ice which is perhaps three thousand feet or more in thickness on the lowlands of the east and west which border on the sea the snow is not permanent as in the interior and here the inhabitants some twelve thousand in number make their homes in the west there is a valuable mine of cryolite, but aside from working this the chief industries are fishing and hunting the winter is bitterly cold but the long days of summer bring enough of sunshine and warmth to produce not only moss and grass and flowering plants but also trailing shrubs and even trees five to six feet in height to the southern shores the kindly ocean currents bring quite an amount of driftwood 
which is of the greatest value to the natives. End of section 87. This recording is in the public domain. Section 88 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 8, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 88 greenland customs of two centuries ago by hans ajid going whaling when they go whale catching they put on their best gear or apparel as if they were going to a wedding feast fancying that if they did not come cleanly and neatly dressed the whale who cannot bear slovenly and dirty habits would shun them and fly from them this is the manner of their expedition about fifty persons men and women set out together in one of the large boats called cone boats the women carry along with them their sewing tackles consisting of needles and thread to sew and mend their husbands spring coats or jackets if they should be torn or pierced through as also to mend the boat in case it should receive any damage the men go in search of the whale and when they have found him they strike him with their harpoons to which are fastened lines or straps two or three fathoms long made of sealskin at the end of which they tie a bag of a whole sealskin filled with air like a bladder in order that the whale when he finds himself wounded and runs away with the harpoon may the sooner be tired the air hindering him from keeping long under water when he grows tired and loses strength they attack him again with their spears and lances till he is killed and then they put on their spring coats made of dressed sealskin all of one piece with boots gloves and caps sewed and laced so tight together that no water can penetrate them in this garb they jump into the sea and begin to slice the fat of him all round the body even under the water for in these coats they cannot sink as they are always full of air so that they can like the seals stand upright in the sea nay they are sometimes so daring that they will get upon the whale's back while there is yet life in him to make an end of him and cut away his fat the houses of the greenlanders as to their houses or dwelling places they have one for the winter season and another for the summer their winter habitation is a low hut built with stone and turf two or three yards high with a flat roof in this hut the windows are on one side made of the boughs of seals dressed and sewed together or of the maws of halibut and are white and transparent on the other side their beds are placed which consist of shelves or benches made up of deal boards raised half a yard from the ground their bedding is made of seal and reindeer skins several families live together in one of these houses or huts each family occupying a room by itself separated from the rest by a wooden post by which also the roof is supported before which there is a hearth or fireplace in which is placed a great lamp in the form of a half-moon seated on a trivet over this are hung their kettles of brass copper or marble in which they boil their victuals under the roof just above the lamp they have a sort of rack or shelf to put their wet clothes upon to dry the fore door or entry of the house is very low so that they must stoop and must creep in upon all fours to get in at it which is so contrived to keep the cold air out as much as possible the inside of the houses is covered or lined with old skins which before have served for the covering of their boats some of these houses are so large that they can harbour seven or eight families upon the benches or shelves where their beds are placed is the ordinary seat of the women attending their work of sewing and making up the clothing the men with their sons occupy the foremost parts of the benches turning their back to the women on the opposite side under the windows the men belonging to the family or strangers take their seats upon the benches there placed i cannot forbear taking notice that although in one of these houses there be ten or twenty train lamps one does not perceive the steam or smoke thereof to fill these small cottages the reason i imagine is the care they take in trimming those lamps viz they take dry moss rubbed very small which they lay on 
one side of the lamp which being lighted burns softly and does not cause any smoke if they do not lay it on too thick or in lumps this fire gives such a heat that it not only serves to boil their victuals but also heats the room to that degree that it is as hot as a bath-house but for those who are not used to this way of firing the smell is very disagreeable as well by the number of burning lamps all fed with train oil as on account of divers sorts of raw meat fishes and fat which they heap up in their habitations these winter habitations they begin to dwell in immediately after michaelmas and leave them again at the approach of the spring which commonly is at the latter end of march and then for the summer season lodge in tents which are their summer habitations these tents are made of rafts or long poles set in a circular form bending at the top and resembling a sugar-loaf and covered with a double cover of which the innermost is of seal or reindeer skins with the hairy side inward if they be rich and the outermost also of the same sort of skins without hair dressed with fat that the rain may not pierce them in these tents they have their beds and lamps to dress their meat with also a curtain made of the guts or boughs of seals sewed together through which they receive the daylight instead of windows every master of a family has got such a tent and a great woman's boat to transport their tents and luggage from place to place where their business calls them games of the greenland boys the boys and lads have also their pastimes and plays when they meet in the evening they take a small piece of wood with a hole in it at one end to which they tie a little pointed stick with a thread of string and throwing the piece with the hole in it up into the air they strive to catch it upon the pointed stick through the hole he that does it twenty times successively and without failing gains the match or party and he that misses gets a black stroke on his forehead for every time he misses another boy's play is a game of chance like cards or dice they have a piece of wood pointed at one end with a pin or peg in the midst upon which it turns when the boys are seated around and every one laid down what they play for one of them turns the pointed piece of wood with his finger that it wheels about like a mariner's compass and when it has done he that the point aims at wins all that was laid down ball playing is their most common diversion which they play two different ways they divide themselves into two parties the first party throws the ball to each other while those of the second party endeavour to get it from them and so by turns the second manner is like our playing at football they mark out two barriers at three or four hundred paces distant one from the other then being divided into two parties as before they meet at the starting place which is at the midway between the two barriers and the ball being thrown upon the ground they strive who first shall get at it and kick it with the foot each party towards their barrier he that is the most nimble-footed and dexterous at it kicking the ball before him and getting first to the barrier has won the match thus they will tell you the deceased play at football in heaven with the head of a moose when it lightens or the north light or aurora borealis appears which they fancy to be the souls of the deceased when their acquaintance from abroad come to see them they spend whole days and nights in singing and dancing and as they love to pass for men of courage and valour they will try forces together in wrestling struggling and playing hook and crook which is to grapple with the arms and fingers made crooked and entangled like hooks whoever can pull the other from his place thinks himself a man of worth and valour the women's or rather the maidens plays consist in dancing around holding one another by the hand forming a circle and singing of songs End of section eighty eight this recording is in the public domain section eighty nine of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eight norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles edited by eva march tappan section eighty nine how to build a woman's boat by dr isaac i hayes a woman's boat or umiak is rowed by women a man will sometimes take the steering oar but he would feel humiliated at rowing in a craft requiring so little skill the kayak is a man's boat 
the editor you will first obtain five round sticks of wood thirty-six feet long more or less according to the length you desire to make the boat these must be as light as possible and not over two inches in diameter since the country produces no wood you will of course have to go to the governor for the materials which he keeps in his storehouses replenishing the stock each year by shipments from denmark but since you will not find a stick thirty-six feet long you will have to procure several which you lash together until you have obtained the requisite length having done this you place three of them on the ground parallel with each other the outer ones being six feet apart then across them at the middle you lash with firm thongs of raw seal hide a piece of inch plank three inches wide and six feet long then you bring the ends of the three long sticks together lashing them firmly next you lash other pieces of board across at intervals of two feet of course these are of different lengths thus you have obtained the bottom of your umiak this done you proceed to erect the skeleton fastening the stem and stern posts firmly with lashings also the ribs the ribs in their place you secure along the inside of them at about sixteen inches above the floor a strip of plank on this you place the thwarts the middle one being six feet long the others shorter as you approach either end ten thwarts is the proper number this completes the skeleton all but the placing of the rails or gunwales which are the two remaining thirty-six foot sticks these being fastened with thongs to the ribs and to the stem and stern posts your skeleton is finished and it is exceedingly light strong and elastic but now instead of covering this novel sort of boat skeleton with planking you stretch over it a coat of seal hide it can scarcely be called leather it has been however tanned and dried and afterwards thoroughly saturated with oil until it is as impervious to water as a plate of iron a number of skins are necessarily required and these the women will sew together for you so firmly with sinew thread that not a drop of water can find its way through the seams this skin coat being cut and fashioned to fit the skeleton as neatly as a slipper to the foot is drawn on and firmly tied it is very soft when you draw it on but when it dries it is as tight and hard as a drum head and when the skin becomes a little old the light will come through it as through parchment when afloat in the umiak you can always discover how much water you are drawing by looking through the side of it this is not a pleasant operation however for a nervous person since one can hardly resist the impression that he is in a very treacherous sort of craft this light and elastic boat is propelled with short oars having broad blades which are tied to the gunwale instead of being thrust out through rowlocks these oars are shod with bone to protect them from the ice a single mast is erected in the bow upon which is run up a square sail when the wind is fair if the owner of the boat is rich enough he gets the material for his sail from the governor but if not he makes it out of seal skins i have observed that he gets the wood from the governor's stores not all of it however for the obliging sea brings him an occasional tree that has floated with the ocean current from the forests of siberia or a plank perhaps that has fallen overboard from a passing vessel or a spar or other portion of a wreck thus before the danes came here did the eskimos obtain all the wood they used from this source they also procured their iron in the shape of spikes nails bands and bars attached to these waifs of the sea thus do the ocean currents which carry heat and cold to the uppermost parts of the earth scatter also blessings to mankind End of section eighty nine this recording is in the public domain
section ninety of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume eight norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles edited by eva march tappan section ninety the eskimos and their ways from the cornhill magazine everybody knows what manner of creature an eskimo is the strange infidel the like of whom was never seen read nor heard tell of as stout martin frobisher describes him from morning to night under my window in jacob Shaven, kirk uh, in nearly seventy degrees north latitude there stands a group of the queer little folks fur-clad from head to foot good-naturedly grinning at our small witticisms in very bad greenlandish until the dirt cracks into huge asterisks on their brown globose good-humoured cheeks all the children have their hair in their eyes and their hands in the pockets of their ragged mangy-looking skin breeches it is summer-time and their toes protrude through their seal-skin boots without fear of frost-bite no sooner do they devour their rather more than modicum of the blubbery seal which their father has killed in his skin kayak than they hurry over the bleak lichen-covered rocks with flowers and ferns and creeping things on the chance of a skilling or a biscuit from the nalagok tuluit the big englishman and they will scramble amid the snow and slush with merry shouts for the smallest coin thrown out to them kayanke kayanke thank you thank you the fortunate one shouts the last syllable echoing from behind the rocks for young greenland is off to hare mersh's the trader to buy lump sugar then there are the women some of them good-looking enough when clean and tidy as for the old ones they are so hideous that i do not at all wonder at some of old frobisher's sailors pulling the boots off one of them to see if her foot was not cloven after the fashion ascribed to the evil one there is now very little pure eskimo blood in danish greenland fair hair and blue eyes are just about as common as black hair and black eyes everybody however dresses a la eskimoiska man woman and child blonde or brunette the woman's dress is not at all inelegant and is much more suited to the climate than would be european garments in the winter all is fur but in summer time a little lighter and more varied raiment is ventured on the round hooded jacket is made of check calico tartan silk or even blue velvet fur-lined made rather short to show the white chemise beneath it would no doubt be warmer to have it a little larger but then fashion sways as much in greenland as in europe and the arctic bells would rather shiver and catch cold than disobey its dictates then the trousers are of sealskin striped with eider ducks necks or ornamented with little strips of the curious skin embroidery so much affected among these people the boots are the grandest of all the articles of wardrobe and are made of dyed sealskin leather some of them have regular tops like a pair of hunting boots and between the foot of the boot and the top is a piece of white calico often embroidered so that the general effect of red and green boots and calico embroidery when collected in a mass on some rocky point as you sail in a greenland fjord is sufficiently striking a white nun-like scarf is sedately folded round the neck and over the breast and the hair is twisted into a top-knot doubled upon itself and tied with a piece of coloured ribbon now this constant pulling up of the hair to the top of the crown is apt to result in a circlet of baldness to conceal this defect the greenland coquette from eight to eighty folds a handkerchief generally of black silk round her head finishing off with a fancy knot in front this knot is pinned on and like the ladies chignon in europe is a hollow sham lined with all sorts of rubbish such as old rags and clippings of seal skins 
the colour of the ribbon with which the knot is tied denotes the condition of life of the wearer when unmarried it is pink when married blue if a widow in service it is green with gold if a widow at home black the description of seal used for dress is also of importance the smooth model casa giac foca betulina being most highly valued for this purpose when a greenland pyramus would grow in favour with his thisbe instead of bijouterie he presents her with what she values rather more albeit she is not insensible to the charms of trinkets a dappled sealskin to make her a pair of trousers some of the young fellows are stalwart handsome fellows and the admixture of danish blood shows itself in the features the nose especially that organ in the regular eskimo being merely a flattened tubercle meandering on either side of his cheeks in an expanse of nostril let us look in on what the english voyagers jocularly call the lieutenant governor his duties are really more those of a country shopkeeper's assistant than anything else hair assistant he is called in the settlement in the books of the government he is styled a volunteer though why he should be so called it is hard to say as he receives pay though certainly that is small enough he is at present in the shop of the settlement very busy but yet with leisure enough to smoke the biggest of big pipes merchanting he assures us is strong work he has absolutely toiled three hours to-day he has just sold three skillings worth of soft soap to an old woman and six skillings worth of coffee to a small boy and is now putting up some eider-down for herr pastor the new missionary who has just arrived with the haval fisk every officer and missionary coming out for the first time is entitled to forty-eight pounds of uncleaned eider-down at six shillings per pound and two bearskins for a sleeping bag at the country trade price of five rigs dollar troops of little boys and women drop in and out for the shop is only open so many hours a day and there is no opposition if you are not pleased with your purchase you will be always most politely told to go to the next shop which is in reykjavik in iceland or possibly moose factory in hudson's straits covet or coffee notwithstanding its high price seems to be the article chiefly in demand whatever else may be wanted covet must be had and to procure this a woman will allow her children to go about like half-skinned seals and her husband to want the most common necessaries no spirits being allowed to be sold the natives take coffee instead and to such an extent that it has been not inaptly styled the curse of greenland for a family to consume one and a half pounds per diem is no uncommon extravagance and the polite little trader turns to his books and shows me that some families when in luck the father having killed a white whale or many seals will use as much as five pounds of coffee daily half of this is wasted in the preparation the green beans are roasted in a pot or on a flat stone until they are charred black they are then smashed up with a stone in an old leather mitten without fingers until they are roughly bruised when they are thrown by the handful into water and boiled for some time the result is a liquid black enough in all conscience with half beans floating about in it and very bitter but it is strong and that is the main thing a bit of candied sugar is taken into the mouth and the coffee is sipped the sugar meantime dissolving and imparting a certain degree of sweetness to the bitter liquid this is drinking coffee a la grand landis but practice is required to accomplish it satisfactorily for the sugar will slip down without the coffee and the coffee without receiving its proper saccharine addition hair assistant asks a hulking-looking greenlander standing at the door with his hands in his pockets why he is not out seal hunting for independently of his regard for the welfare of the natives herr kola nebestirer is directly interested in the produce of the hunt he gives a growl and replies i've had no covet to-day and then as if correcting himself besides there is a hole in my kayak and my boy is not well and but the real truth was no covet just as i am talking to him a little boy who is working for me begs a few skillings on account as he is out of covet and finds it impossible to get along without his accustomed beverage then arrive two brothers from a distant settlement with blubber and skins which net nearly two pounds what do they buy some bread some butter some tobacco a little powder 
and shot the rest all goes in coffee and sugar the butter is of course quite in their way my friend the schoolmaster of christian's hob is rather fond of thanks or the refuse of the blubber and butter a rather greasy dish however the traditional blubber eating of the natives is so far as danish greenland is concerned rather mythical blubber is too precious for winter light and heat to be rashly expended as food and accordingly we find that they use it but rarely and only as we would use fat to lean meat the shop itself is about as dirty a little shop as could be imagined containing everything which could possibly be required for use either among the danes or eskimo all heaped up in confusion they the greenlanders are very humorous people fond of little rough jokes and most communicative and pleasant with those whom they like and trust but they are very little to be depended on and are curiously vacillating and fickle however if they once decide not to go anywhere with a person whom they despise or dislike no bribe will tempt them to change their determination though on the other hand even if you are a favourite it is not altogether certain that they will really go with you until you are fairly outside of the place the only way to secure them is to advance a little of their pay beforehand they are never known to break a contract of this nature but then they must have their own way and to pass a trading post without sleeping and drinking cobbett would be an innovation unheard of in greenland on all sides you would be told that it was impossible they are fond of ridiculing the europeans indeed this forms their principal amusement in the winter any little peculiarity in person manner or conduct will be instantly noted within a day of your arrival the result is that no european in the country is known by anything but some sobriquet sometimes not over complimentary one of the governors who has a remarkably prominent nose is called kringalik the nose another tolgak the raven from his dark complexion the third pitted with the smallpox is known as cheese rind ball the naturalist was known by a word which signifies the diligent catcher the name being applied in derision of his entomological and botanical researches and not in admiration of his ability to catch seals of which indeed he caught none one of our party being a little stout man was called at one place apelier soak the little auk or rotgee and at another settlement he used to be known as the peddler hair a being a collector of all sorts of eskimo curiosities while another foreigner who did not impress the people much with his wisdom is remembered as pitlokiak the weak-minded man or fool the present writer was first called yusuk the bearded seal and finally settled down as being the tallest man of the party into nerker soak great muscle nerke flesh soak great they are very fond of a name which by a slight twist of the tongue can be converted into a double entendre as many eskimo words can be several only differing slightly in the sound though with an entirely different meaning of course you are the last man to know of your own name among themselves they are not a whit better ask a native his name and he will hesitate to tell you if it is very good his modesty will keep him from mentioning it but if it is the contrary his shame will equally act as a barrier to your acquiring the desired information in reality very vain and great braggarts they are affectedly modest when speaking of themselves or their property would you lend me they would say your fine large kayak as my miserable thing has got a hole in it in every district or two the government appoints a parson and all the natives are nominally christians and are baptized married and buried after the lutheran fashion the priest comes round when he has time and marries them in batches a certain dispensation being allowed in the meantime and a refusal to complete his engagement being perfectly unknown on the side of the male lover the lutheran missionaries are supported by the government and come out for a term of years greenland falling to the lot generally of the least brilliant of the theological licentiates of copenhagen university the moravians the celebrated unitas fratrum of herrnhut in germany also have missions in south greenland but they are not allowed to stretch farther north than sixty-five degrees and it is only recently that they were allowed to baptize and marry they are a self-denying set of men and women but much too austere for the greenlanders temporal welfare round a moravian settlement the natives are generally a miserable ragged set of wretches attendance at church three times a day allowing of little time to attend to seal catching the danes though they bring out stores to them yet do not like them the proverbial professional hatred not being starved even out of greenland and moreover the hernhushans are germans 
there is not now a real healthy pagan in danish greenland hans hendrik's smith sound wife so celebrated in dr hayes's narrative being the last but shang hu's pretty daughter whose love episode poor cain has told us all about is now settled down at proven a regularly christened woman occasionally a wandering savage or two comes round cape farewell from the east coast from unknown lands only a few years ago some came to piam luck declaring that it was two years since they had left their homes in the far north somewhere near the pole doubtless such windfalls are however soon pounced upon by the nearest parson and baptized nolans wolans under the name of peter or jens or hans and a most gushing description of his conversion instantly dispatched by the next ship to the danska missionaire tidska krift the last real pagan however was an old fellow who lived up at upernavik in seventy degrees north latitude when asked to be a christian he would slap his broad chest and shout in a voice as if from a drum why should i be baptized i can provide for my family i don't hang on the whites like the baptized greenlanders and so a pagan lived and died this representative man every sunday there is service in the little wooden church the men sitting on one side and the women on the other the priest is a sight for gods and men clad in his sealskin trousers and boots with a dogskin jacket the collar of which peeps up above his high lutheran ruff services in eskimo as are also the sweetly sung hymns an eskimo plays the organ very well indeed while the congregation intone out some such hymn as the following Skarbutsarmetatanko upkautigagat sorpok inerlunga lor merput etc on a summer morning when it is in session there issues through the cracks in the church door an unmistakable odour of ancient seal the church wall seems to be a regular place for hanging up all sorts of implements of the chase for instance there is a musket or two hanging in the corner some paddles harpoons and seal lines all on the outside it seems as if some of old pliny's hyperbore had hung up their arms on the walls of the temple of neptune in gratitude for their escape from shipwreck end of section ninety this recording is in the public domain section ninety one of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eight norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles edited by eva march tappan section ninety one the farewell of the greenlanders from the cornhill magazine the time comes when we must leave and all is packing up and good-bye with heron englander every day little deputations arrive to ask us to drink coffee before some hospitable threshold or to take some little farewell dinner one of these kindly acts of hyperborean though by no means frigid hospitality seems worthy of being recorded in these notes as being one of the last of the many acts of good-will and warm-heartedness received from a people whom i can scarcely hope ever to see again samuel was one of the most respectable of the mixed race of greenlanders about our neighbourhood a skilful hunter artificer and maker of many curiosities for which he had found a customer in me he insisted that i should danish fashion take cobbett with him as i saw that the invitation was intended as a special mark of favour and that the refusal would be a mortal affront i complied most gracefully though i had drunk so much black coffee that day as to give me little hope of sleeping at night his house was the ordinary turf mansion situated in a little valley and entered by the usual tunnel the interior was in no way much different from the others except that it boasted a greater variety of knick-knacks a dutch clock a cupboard and several glaring prints of the emperor of the french his empress and a fierce red-faced gentleman whom i had some difficulty in discovering to be intended for albert edward prins of Vales, og hertog of cornwall 
i was here introduced to samuel's wife and daughter the latter with the softest brown eyes and auburn hair i ever saw both of whom were busily manufacturing articles of household attire on the brecks or general platform which occupies one side of the house and serves the purposes of bed table and chair the house is very warm and i am begged to take off my coat following in this fashion the rest of the family most of whom are in a state of semi nudity there are many other folks there but they are of the commonalty and beneath the tall lewitt's attention i however notice them patronizingly and they grin from ear to ear by way of reply while the rather lengthy operation of preparing the coffee goes on the family produce their panates to entertain me while the women examine the texture of my coat and scarlet shirt most knowingly samuel shows me his tools and how he uses them his spears and harpoons an alanox and the work-box he made for his wife which does him much credit and some patterns for slippers painted in colours by his little boy who was once one of my particular henchmen but is now dead he himself has just recovered from a long sickness and is very pale he plays a tune on the fiddle and the younger members of his family who have been out gathering blueberries dance most joyfully to it he has likewise an accordion he apologizes for it being a little out of tune but he had had to open it to show the children where the sound came from and then the wife who has been a handsome blue-eyed woman in her day for they are of course all of a mixed breed with a woman's curiosity questions me in broken danish and english and eskimo all about my condition in life if i am married and how many children and so on and so on and all the gossips are delighted they to my astonishment inquire if i do not come from scotland and on my expressing astonishment at their knowledge of geography samuel produces an ancient map and points out the land of my nativity all this is done leisurely as the cobbit boils and as i sip it in the cleanest of cups they pour in the soft unction of hyperborean flattery and assure me with an air which means even more than the words would seem to express afflete ianlach to lewit you are the good englishman all the inuit eskimo will miss you when you are gone and the little boys will have no one to throw skillings to them now all of us will have sick hearts when you go away to all of which an ancient dame on the farther side of the brecks whom i had hitherto thought only a bundle of sealskins echoes in a voice as if it came out of a mattress yes especially the neviar suik girls and the house echoes with laughter as the joke is apparently thought a good one i grin like the rest as it is explained to me though samuel's daughter blushes crimson for she is apparently the butt of it be it known however that the daughter of samuel bears a highly proper reputation in etlumia and is i am told in a stage whisper at which she again blushes to be the spouse of peter zacharias brood when that young gentleman has finished his new kayak and pastor nielsen has time to unite them in the bonds of wedlock after we have finished our coffee we have blueberries and a glass of schnapps which last is produced with the air of smuggled whisky and when we consider how dearly they all like this beverage the extent of the favour may be imagined when all is over and the autumn sun is getting low i am escorted to the door by the whole family with many good-byes and hopes to see me again next year and take my departure homeward we have a long way yet to go before we meet the stout ship which is to take us to denmark we have to share some snowy nights the hospitality of an eskimo hut but savoury and very warm and to pass miserable days and nights enow in dreary akajaroa snow is falling fast as we leave greenland behind all have some little regrets at leaving it one thinks of the eider ducks and the reindeer another of the glorious glaciers and icebergs like silver castles floating in the summer sunlight on an emerald sea everybody joins in one regret that the free and easy life so novel and so wild is at an end 
that behind lies life in its wildest aspect before us in its most civilized but also most artificial form end of section ninety one this recording is in the public domain section ninety two of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in september two thousand nineteen the world's story volume eight norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles edited by eva march tappan section ninety two what is an iceberg by dr isaac i hayes observe the little bit of ice that clinks in your tumbler at dinner time observe it closely and you will perceive how very small a part of it floats above the surface of the water that part is about one-tenth but it floats in fresh water change it to sea water and the part above would be one-eighth now this little bit of ice is an iceberg in miniature an iceberg in every essential feature except that it did not in all human probability come from greenland in form in general transparency in the play of light upon it in its prismatic character in the shape of its projecting tongues which lie beneath the surface of the waves in the delicate mist which plays around it in the warm air it is the very image on a small scale of those great monoliths of the arctic frost which come sailing down baffin's bay with the polar current in all their stately grandeur and magnificence it is difficult for the imagination to conceive of the great magnitude of some of these greenland icebergs and yet they are but comparatively trifling pieces torn by the sea from glaciers the iceberg is indeed as the paring of a finger-nail to the whole body when compared to the quantity of ice in the reservoir from which it came magnify the bit of ice in your tumbler until it becomes to your imagination half a mile in diameter each way and you have a mass that is far from uncommon add to this a mile two miles of length and you have what may be sometimes seen i have sailed alongside of an iceberg two miles and a quarter before coming to the end of it yet this is not greater in proportion to the entire greenland accumulation than the little bit of ice in your tumbler is to the immense stores which the ice monopolists have in their storehouses when they stand ready to avow and do avow that the stock is nearly exhausted and that they propose to double their charges on you just when the hottest weather oppresses the city the name iceberg signifies ice mountain and mountainous it truly is in size lifted out of the water and it becomes a mountain five hundred a thousand two thousand or three thousand feet high in dimensions it is as if the city of new york were turned adrift in the atlantic or the central park were cut out and launched in the same place and an iceberg of the dimensions of central park is far from unusual in general outline of surface the resemblance is often equally good it is undulating like the park and craggy and is crossed by ravines and dotted with lakes the waters of which are formed from the melting snows of the late winter which have fallen upon it and also of the ice itself after the snows have disappeared before the rays of the summer's sun in such a lake i have even once bathed although i am glad to say but once and that was in the days of other years when the youthful impulse was strong to say i have done it a disease which i believe to be amenable to that treatment popularly known as sad experience skating on an iceberg lake is more satisfactory and sensible though it is just as well to give an iceberg as wide a berth as possible and have as little to do with it as you can at all times for it is liable to go to pieces though this rarely happens in winter when you are least expecting it 
I have often climbed them, however, and with different motives, sometimes to aid in watering the ship, for the lakes upon them are of the best and purest water, sometimes to obtain a distant view, at other times for the mere purpose of curiosity and adventure. Ordinarily, a slope may be found by which the ascent can be made without difficulty, but sometimes spikes in the heels and a boat hook in the hand become necessary. Frequently, however, the sides are quite vertical all around, and it cannot be scaled at all. On one occasion, I measured an iceberg that presented on one of its sides a vertical wall that rose 315 feet above the level of the sea. Another one that I saw in the upper part of Baffin's Bay, and measured carefully, I will describe minutely. The sea was quite smooth and the day calm, so that I enjoyed a most excellent opportunity, such a one as I never had before, and probably shall never have again. This iceberg was not only remarkable for its size, but for its great variety of feature. I rode all the way around it, and measured it as carefully as possible. One of its sides was nearly straight and regular, having the appearance of being recently broken from the glacier. When facing the sun, it glistened marvellously. This side was 6,500 feet long, about a mile and a quarter. At one end it was 240 feet high, rising separately from the sea. At the centre the height was less, being only 160 feet. At the other end it was 190. These measurements were made with as much accuracy as was attainable under the circumstances, and are quite reliable within small limits. The log line and chronometer, the one to measure distance, the other to note time, were of necessity the means of obtaining the length. For the height I dropped the chip at the base of the iceberg, and then, rowing out a hundred fathoms, I had a tolerably good baseline for obtaining the altitude, a pocket sextant giving me the necessary angles. Say that I made a mistake of twenty-five feet, it is yet near enough for all practical purposes. It was big enough in all conscience, anyway. In measuring my lengths, I was not so liable to error, and in the same manner as before, I found one end of the berg to be eighteen hundred feet across. Here it terminated in a rounded bluff that was one hundred and twenty feet high. Turning at the base of this rounded bluff, I came upon a side wholly different from the one I had before measured. It had evidently been for a long time the front of the glacier, perhaps for a period of fifteen or twenty years, or even more. It was everywhere irregular. In places it was cliff-like, as was the other, but for the most part it was worn into all sorts of irregular shapes. This had been done partly by the washings of the sea, partly by the sun, and partly by the streams of water which poured from the glacier while this iceberg was a part of it. There were bays in the side of it large enough to float the frigate. The panther might have gone in and turned around upon her heel without fear of striking. In another place there was a considerable bay, with two ice islands in it that were very peculiar. To this bay they were as Governor's Island and Ellis Island to the Bay of New York, and they had as firm a foundation, but the bottom upon which they rested was ice. They were mere hummocks, and the water on the berg was quite shoal. Yet we went in at least a hundred yards before we reached the shore of it, all the while being really on the iceberg, for the ice projected away out beneath us, and as I looked over the side of the boat down through the clear bright water, which we were shoaling constantly, I thought I had never seen a more perfectly graduated tint than that from the deep water when we first came over the ice to the margin of the bay. It was as if we sailed through liquid emerald. I landed upon the shore of this bay and climbed the iceberg. It was not an easy climb, even with the aid of steel spikes in my heels and a boat hook in my hand. In places the ascent was very steep, and had I lost my footing, I should have slid down at a fearful pace into the sea. Upon reaching the surface I found it to be rolling and much broken. 
there were two conspicuous hills upon it, one of which was two hundred and ninety, the other two hundred and seventy feet above the sea level. At least, this was the record of my barometer. Between these hills, and among others less conspicuous, I discovered a lake a quarter of a mile long. Its course was winding like the lake of Central Park, which it resembled in size. I followed along its shore until I found the outlet, and there, through a narrow gorge, the overflow of the lake was rushing over a crystal bed in a rapid torrent, until coming at length to the side of the berg the pure cold stream leaped wildly down into the ocean, roaring like a youthful Niagara and breaking into spray. On every side there were indeed streams, most of them quite small, so that the whole iceberg was shedding water on every side, and the constant sound of innumerable cascades charmed the ear with their ceaseless roar. From the lake I wandered among the icy hills until I grew bewildered, and I found my way back to the place of ascent not without embarrassment. The cause of this was partially explained. The iceberg was revolving— and as I steered my course back by the sun, I naturally mistook the direction, until I had discovered what was wrong, when I began to look for the two hills first mentioned, by which I recovered my bearings, and was soon on the right track again. Upon climbing these ice hills I obtained a grand view. The whole sea was studded with icebergs, hundreds of them there must have been, of every conceivable shape, from the great wall-sided mass that looked like a floating huge castle, to the colossal effigy of some winged monster floating upon the sea. Although on an iceberg I was not without life to keep me company. A flock of kittiwake gulls flew about my head, and, perching upon a hill, set up their noisy chatter, and one old burgomaster gull, who had caught a fish, came there to swallow it in peace. But, to his evident surprise and sad disgust, he was suddenly pounced upon by a predatory jager, who had seemingly been hovering round for just such a chance, and, with an angry scream, the burgomaster, who had started off when he saw his enemy, gave up his prize, which the jager quickly caught in mid-air. It was altogether a strange sensation, afloat at so great an elevation on an ice mountain in the sea. Yet my footstool was warm and solid as the internal hills. Had time and circumstances permitted, I should gladly have carried up my camp fixtures and remained there for a day or so, watching the grand panorama of the hills and sea, while the sun, like a golden wheel in the blue sky, rolled around me, changing from hour to hour the aspect of every object within the range of vision, now silvering an iceberg, now colouring it, while it floated sometimes in a sea of blue, and again of green, now blazing with red the rugged cliffs of the fjord, now throwing them in shadow, as if they were the gloomy walls encompassing the abyss of Dante's giants, now gilding the distant mountains, now robing them in purple, now silvering the far-off mere de glass, then melting it into a sea of rubies, or blending it with the blue skies. For such scenes I have often witnessed in the Arctic seas, though not from the summit of an iceberg. But this camp on the iceberg was not possible, so when I had found my way, I descended from my lofty elevation to the boat, and then, pulling on around the berg, completed my survey of it. The scenery was much varied as we passed along. At one time we were beneath a dismantled tower, at another time a ruined spire, then a deep cleft of blue, or a dark cavern of green, in which the slow-moving billows were caught and confined, until, as if tired of their imprisonment, their hollow voices came gurgling out like the loud breathing of some mighty monster of the deep, exhausted with his efforts to move the mountain from his path. The side along which we were now passing proved to be six thousand feet in length. The end beyond was thirty-five hundred. Thus, in making the complete circuit of the iceberg, we had pulled almost three and a half miles. The altitude of the berg I averaged at one hundred and eighty feet above the sea level, 
which would give a total average depth of fourteen hundred and forty feet, or more than a quarter of a mile. Multiply these figures, and we obtain a local cubical contents of twenty-three billion eight hundred fifty million feet. Convert this into tons, and all the carrying capacity of all the ships in the world are as nothing to it. Freight them all with ice cut from it, and an impression would hardly be made upon it. It is only by such figuring that we can form anything like an adequate idea of the enormous magnitude of this huge vagrant of the Arctic seas. Its beauties are not defined so readily. Solid and mighty, it is yet a subtle object. The light plays through it as through the opal. Flashes of every color come from it. Here we see the emerald, there chalcedony, and again transparent quartz or sapphire, the topaz or the ruby, as the sun's rays dart through its sharp angles, or the tintings of the clouds are reflected from its sides. More than this I cannot say of the floating ice mountain. Words fail utterly in the description of such a mighty work of nature, fail as completely as do the pigments of the painter. Who could paint, or who describe the leap of Niagara, or the roar that rises from the great abyss? At best, the effort of the artist gives but a vague idea of the truth. The iceberg, in its birth, growth, and immensity, on the varying phases which it presents at different times, the subtle quality of the light and colour which play around it, is utterly beyond the reach of art. And who could paint, or who describe its age? Nothing but actual observation will even so much as suggest the long period occupied in its formation. Close inspection will reveal an infinite number of lines of stratification, which, like the multiplied rings of the old forest oak, mark the years of its increase, and tell of the untold ages during which it was growing in the parent glacier. But there is nothing in it or about it to fix the period when the hardened snowflakes which compose it were first dropped upon the Greenland hills, nothing to show its steady growth through the recurring cycles of time. End of section 92《Section 93 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in September 2019. — The World's Story, Volume 8 Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 93. Escaping from a Glacier. By Dr. Isaac I. Hayes. During the absence of the captain and myself from the vessel, the artists had not been idle. They had landed near the glacier, and with brush and camera had begun their work. The day was warm, the mercury rising to sixty-eight degrees in the shade, and the sun, coming around to the south, blazed upon the cold, icy wall. This must have produced some difference of temperature between the ice touched by the solar rays and that of the interior, which was in all probability several degrees below the freezing point, for towards noon there was an incessant crackling along the entire front of ice. Small pieces were split off with explosive violence, and, falling to the sea, produced a fine effect as the spray and water spurted from the spot where they struck. Scarcely an instant passed without a disturbance occurring of this kind. It was like a fusillade of artillery. Now and then a mass of considerable size would break loose, producing an impression both upon the eye and ear that was very startling. By one o'clock everybody had come on board to dinner, and for a while we all stood on deck watching the spectacle and noting the changes that took place with interest. It was observed, among other curious phenomena, that when the ice broke off, the fractured surface was deep blue, and that if any ice, as sometimes happened, came up from beneath the water, it bore the same color, 
but after a short exposure to the sun the surface changed and became almost pure white with the satin glitter before described our situation for a view could not have been better chosen and it is not likely that such an opportunity was ever enjoyed before by explorers since it is not probable that a vessel ever rode before at her anchor so near a glacier after dinner the work was to be resumed the photographers hastened ashore hoping to catch an instantaneous view of some tumbling fragment which if they could have done would certainly have exceeded in interest any other view they had secured the question of moving our anchorage was deferred to the captain who decided to go over to the other side when the artists had been put ashore with their tools steam was indeed already up the boat had reached the shore for this purpose and had shoved off for the ship leaving the artists on the beach and the order had been given by the captain to up anchor when loud reports were heard one after another in quick succession a number of large pieces had broken off and their fall disturbed the sea to such an extent that the vessel began to roll quite perceptibly and waves broke with considerable force upon the shore then without a moment's warning there was a report louder than any we had yet heard it was evident that some unusual event was about to happen and a feeling of alarm was generally experienced casting my eyes in the direction from which the sound proceeded the cause of it was at once explained the very centre or extreme point of the glacier was in a state of apparent disintegration here the ice was peculiarly picturesque and we had never ceased to admire it and sketch and photograph it a perfect forest of gothic spires more or less symmetrical gave it the appearance of a vast cathedral fashioned by the hands of man the origin of these spires will be readily understood to be in consequence first of the formation of crevasses far up on the glacier and secondly by the spaces between them widening and sharpening and rounding off by the action of the sun as the glacier steadily approaches the sea at the base of these spires there were several pointed arches some of them almost perfect in form which still further strengthened the illusion that they might be of human and not of natural creation at the extreme point there was one spire that stood out quite detached almost from the water's edge to its summit this could not have been much less than two hundred feet high i had passed very near this while crossing over in the boat and the front of it appeared to extend vertically down to the bottom in the clear green water for the muddy water of the southern side did not reach over so far i could trace it a long way into the sea i had little idea then how treacherous an object it was or i would not have ventured so near for i was not more than a boat's length from it the last and loudest report as above mentioned came from this wonderful spire which was sinking down it seemed indeed as if the foundations of the earth were giving way and that the spire was descending into the yawning depths below the effect was magnificent it did not topple over and fall headlong but went down bodily and in doing so crumbled into numberless pieces the process was not instantaneous but lasted for the space of at least a quarter of a minute it broke up as if it were composed of scales the fastenings of which had given way layer after layer until the very core was reached and there was nothing left of it but we could not witness this process of disintegration in detail after the first few moments for the whole glacier almost to its summit became enveloped in spray a semi-transparent cloud through which the crumbling of the ice could be faintly seen shouts of admiration and astonishment burst from the ship's company the greatest danger would scarcely have been sufficient to withdraw the eye from the fascinating spectacle but when the summit of the spire began to sink away amidst the great white mass of foam and mist into which it finally disappeared the enthusiasm was unbounded by this time however other portions of the glacier were undergoing a similar transformation 
influenced no doubt by the shock which had been communicated by this first disruption other spires less perfect in their form disappeared in the same manner and great scales peeling from the glacier in various places fell into the sea with a prolonged crash and followed by a loud hissing and crackling sound then in the general confusion all particular reports were swallowed up in one universal roar which woke the echoes of the hills and spread consternation to the people on the panther's deck this consternation increased with every moment for the roar of the falling and crumbling ice was drowned in a peal compared to which the loudest thunder of the heavens would be but a feeble sound it seemed as if the foundations of the earth which had given way to admit the sinking ice were now rent asunder and the world seemed to tremble from the commencement of the crumbling to this moment the increase of sound was steady and uninterrupted it was like the wind which moaning through the trees before a storm elevates its voice with its multiplying strength and lays the forest low in the crash of the tempest the whole glacier about the place where these disturbances were occurring was enveloped in a cloud which rose up over the glacier as one sees the mist rising from the abyss below niagara and receiving the rays of the sun hold a rainbow fluttering above the vortex while the fearful sound was pealing forth i saw a blue mass rising through the cloud at first slowly then with a bound and now from out the foam and mist a wave of vast proportions rolled away in a widening semicircle i could watch the glacier no more the instinct of self-preservation drove me to seize the first firm object i could lay my hands upon and grasp it with all my strength the wave came down upon us with the speed of the wind the swell occasioned by an earthquake can alone compare with it in magnitude it rolled beneath the panther lifted her upon its crest and swept her towards the rocks an instant more and i was flat upon the deck borne down by the stroke of falling water the wave had broken on the abrupt shore and after touching the rocks with its crest a hundred feet above our heads had curled backward and striking the ship with terrific force had deluged the decks a second wave followed before the shock of the first had fairly ceased and broke over us in like manner another and another came after in quick succession but each was smaller than the one preceding it the panther was driven within two fathoms of the shore but she did not strike thank heaven our anchor held or our ship would have been knocked to pieces or landed high and dry with the first great wave that rolled under us when it became evident that we were safe our thoughts naturally flew to our comrades on the shore to our great joy they too were safe but they had not had time to clamber up the steep acclivity before the first wave had buried them flinging themselves flat upon the ground when they discovered that escape was hopeless and clinging to each other and to the rocks they prevented themselves from being carried off or seriously hurt one had been lifted from his feet and hurled with much force against a rock but excepting a few bruises he was not injured and with much fervour thanked heaven that it was no worse he had indeed abundant cause had the party not been favoured by the rocks which were of such formation that they could readily spring up from ledge to ledge they must have all perished the wave before it reached them had expended much of its force if they had been upon the beach and received the full force of the blow they would inevitably have been killed outright or drowned in the undertow their implements bottles plates everything were either gone or were a perfect wreck fortunately their cameras were upon the hillside and beyond the reach of the wave where they had used them in the morning the boat also was safe she had been hauled out some distance from the shore and by putting her head to the waves she rowed in security the agitation of the sea continued for half an hour after the first wave broke upon us 
This was partly a prolongation of the first disturbance, but proceeded mainly from the original cause still operating. The iceberg had been born amidst the great confusion, and as it was the rolling up of the vast mass which sent that first wave away in a widening semicircle, so it was the rocking to and fro of the monster that continued the agitation of the sea, for this newborn child of the Arctic frosts seemed loath to come to rest in its watery cradle. And what an azure gem it was! Glittering while it moved there in the bright sunshine like a mammoth lapis lazuli set in a sea of chased silver, for the waters all around were but one mass of foam. I measured this iceberg afterwards and found its height above the surface of the water to be 140 feet, which, supposing the same proportions to continue all the way down, would give a total depth of 1120 feet, since the proportion of ice below to that above is as seven to one. Its circumference was almost a mile. No wonder that its birth was attended with such fearful consequences. The part which had been the top of the glacier had become the bottom of the iceberg. The fragment, when it broke off, had performed an entire half-revolution. Hence it was that no part of it was white. But as the day wore on, the delicate hue which it first showed vanished, and before the berg finally disappeared down the fjord, it wore the usual opaque white, which distinguishes its older brothers who have drifted in Baffin's Bay for perhaps a score of years. As may well be supposed, we did not wait for another iceberg to catch us in such a defenceless situation. Our jolly captain was now quite content to own that he held glaciers in profound respect, and lost no time, therefore, in picking up his anchor. Then, as soon as our bruised and thoroughly drenched artists were brought aboard, the panther wheeled upon her heel and steamed over to the opposite side, where, at a more respectful distance, anchorage was found which promised safety if the glacier should take upon itself once more to perform such fantastic freaks as the one of which we had like to have been victims, and we had no mind now for another such dangerous encounter. End of section 93 Section 94 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Read for LibriVox.org. The Search for the Poles, Part 1. Adventures in the Frozen North. Historical Note. Lord Dufferin thus describes the intense cold of the North. Quote, no description can give an adequate idea of the intense rigor of the six months winter in this part of the world. Stones crack with the noise of thunder. In a crowded hut, the breath of its occupants will fall in flakes of snow. Wine and spirits turn to ice. The snow burns like caustic. If iron touches the flesh, it brings the skin away with it. The soles of your stockings may be burnt off your feet before you feel the slightest warmth from the fire. Linen taken out of boiling water instantly stiffens to the consistency of a wooden board, and heated stones will not prevent the sheets of the bed from freezing. If these are the effects of the climate within an air-tight, fire-warmed, crowded hut, what must they be among the dark, storm-lashed mountain peaks outside? Unquote. In Arctic exploration there is danger of freezing, of starvation, of death by a score of different accidents, and yet there is a lure of the North so strong and so fascinating that those who have once felt it are rarely satisfied without making a second trial of its beauties and its perils. End of section 94. This recording is in the public domain. Section 95 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 8. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. 
edited by eva march tappan section ninety five spitzbergen the island that belongs to no one by lord dufferin in the icelandic sagas it is written that in eleven ninety four land was discovered a four days sail to the northeast of iceland this land was undoubtedly spitzbergen the editor it was at one o'clock in the morning on the sixth of august eighteen fifty six that after having been eleven days at sea we came to an anchor in the silent haven of english bay spitzbergen and now how shall i give you an idea of the wonderful panorama in the midst of which we found ourselves i think perhaps its most striking feature was the stillness and deadness and impassibility of this new world ice and rock and water surrounded us not a sound of any kind interrupted the silence the sea did not break upon the shore no bird or any living thing was visible the midnight sun by this time muffled in a transparent mist shed an awful mysterious luster on glacier and mountain no atom of vegetation gave token of the earth's vitality and universal numbness and dumbness seemed to pervade the solitude i suppose in scarcely any other part of the world is the appearance of deadness so strikingly exhibited on the stillest summer day in england there is always perceptible an undertone of life thrilling through the atmosphere and though no breeze should stir a single leaf yet in default of motion there is always a sense of growth but here not so much as a blade of grass was to be seen on the sides of the bald excavated hills primeval rocks and eternal ice constitute the landscape the anchorage where we had brought up is the best to be found with the exception perhaps of magdalena bay along the whole west coast of spitzbergen indeed it is almost the only one where you are not liable to have the ice set in upon you at a moment's notice ice sound bell sound horn sound the other harbors along the west coast are all liable to be beset by drift ice during the course of a single night even though no vestige of it may have been in sight four and twenty hours before and many a good ship has been inextricably imprisoned in the very harbor to which she had fled for refuge this bay is completely landlocked being protected on its open side by prince charles forland a long island lying parallel with the mainland down towards either horn run two ranges of shinstos rocks about fifteen hundred feet high their sides almost precipitous and the topmost ridge as sharp as a knife and jagged as a saw the intervening space is entirely filled up by an enormous glacier which descending with one continuous incline from the head of a valley on the right and sweeping like a torrent round the roots of an isolated clump of hills in the centre rolls at last into the sea the length of the glacier river from the spot where it apparently first originated could not have been less than thirty or thirty-five miles or its greatest breadth less than nine or ten but so completely did it fill up the higher end of the valley that it was as much as you could do to distinguish the farther mountains peeping up over its surface the height of the precipice where it fell into the sea i should judge to have been about one hundred and twenty feet on the left a still more extraordinary sight presented itself a kind of baby glacier actually hung half suspended halfway on the hillside like a tear in the act of rolling down the furrowed cheek of the mountain i have tried to convey to you a notion of the following impetus impressed on the surface of the jan mayan ice rivers but in this case so unaccountable did it seem that the overhanging mass of ice should not continue to thunder down upon its course that one's natural impulse was to shrink from crossing the path along which a breath a sound might precipitate the suspended avalanche into the valley nothing is more dangerous than to approach these cliffs of ice every now and then huge masses detach themselves from the face of the crystal steep and topple over into the water and woe be to the unfortunate ship which might happen to be passing below scoresby himself actually witnessed a mass of ice the size of a cathedral thunder down into the sea from a height of four hundred feet frequently during our stay at spitzbergen 
we ourselves observed specimens of these ice avalanches and scarcely an hour passed without the solemn silence of the bay being disturbed by the thunderous boom resulting from similar catastrophes occurring in adjacent valleys as soon as we had thoroughly taken in the strange features of the scene around us we all turned in for a night's rest i was dog-tired as much with anxiety as want of sleep for in continuing to push on to the northward in spite of the ice i naturally could not help feeling that if any accident occurred the responsibility would rest with me and although i do not believe that we were at any time in any real danger yet from our inexperience in the peculiarities of arctic navigation i think the coolest judgment would have been liable to occasional misgivings as to what might arise from possible contingencies now however all was right the result had justified our anticipations we had reached the so longed-for goal and as i stowed myself snugly away in the hollow of my cot i could not help heartily congratulating myself that for that night at all events there was no danger of the ship knocking a hole in her bottom against some hummock which the lookout had been too sleepy to observe and that wilson could not come in the next morning and announce ice all around all around in a quarter of an hour afterwards all was still on board the foam and the lonely little ship lay floating on the glassy bosom of the sea apparently as inanimate as the landscape immediately after breakfast we pulled to the shore carrying in the gig with us the photographic apparatus tents guns ammunition and the goat poor old thing she had suffered dreadfully from seasickness and i thought a run ashore might do her good on the left-hand side of the bay between the foot of the mountain and the sea there ran a low flat belt of black moss about half a mile broad and as this appeared the only point in the neighborhood likely to offer any attraction to reindeer it was on this side that i determined to land my chief reason for having run into english bay rather than magdalena bay was because we had been told at hammerfest that it was the more likely place of the two for deer and as we were sadly in want of fresh meat this advantage quite decided us in our choice as soon therefore as we had superintended the erection of the tent and set wilson hard at work cleaning the glasses for the photographs we slung our rifles on our backs and set off in search of deer but in vain did i peer through my telescope across the dingy flat in front not a vestige of a horn was to be seen although in several places we came upon impressions of their track at last our confidence in the reports of their great plenty became considerably diminished still the walk was very refreshing after our confinement on board and although the thermometer was below freezing the cold only made the exercise more pleasant a little to the northward i observed lying on the seashore innumerable logs of driftwood this wood is floated all the way from america by the gulf stream and as i walked from one huge bowl to another i could not help wondering in what primeval forest each had grown what chance had originally cast them on the waters and piloted them to this desert shore mingled with the fringe of unhewn timber that lined the beach lay waifs and strays of a more sinister kind pieces of broken spars in oar a boat's flagstaff and a few shattered fragments of some long-lost vessel's planking here and there too we would come upon skulls of walrus ribs and shoulder blades of bears brought possibly by the ice in winter turning again from the sea we resumed our search for deer but two or three hours more very stiff walking produced no better luck suddenly a cry from fitz who had wandered a little to the right brought us helter-skelter to the spot where he was standing but it was not a stag he called us to come and look upon half embedded in the black moss at his feet there lay a gray deal coffin falling almost to pieces with age the lid was gone blown off probably by the wind and within were stretched the bleaching bones of a human skeleton a rude cross at the head of the grave still stood partially upright and a half obliterated dutch inscription preserved a record of the dead man's name and age van der schelling coman jacob moore obi 
to June 1758, A.T. 44. It was evidently some poor whaler of the last century to whom his companions had given the only burial possible in this frost-hardened earth, which even the summer sun has no force to penetrate beyond a couple of inches, and which will not afford to man the shallowest grave. A bleak resting place where that hundred years slumber, I thought, as I gazed on the dead mariner's remains. On another part of the coast we found two other corpses, yet more scantily sepulchred, without so much as a cross to mark their resting place. Even in the palmy days of the whale fisheries, it was the practice of the Dutch and English sailors to leave the wooden coffins in which they had placed their comrades' remains exposed upon the shore. And I have been told by an eyewitness that in Magdalena Bay there were to be seen, even to this day, the bodies of men who died upwards of two hundred and fifty years ago. In such complete preservation, that when you pour hot water on the icy covering which encases them, you can actually see the unchanged features of the dead through the transparent incrustation. As soon as Fitz had gathered a few of the little flowering mosses that grew inside the coffin, we proceeded on our way, leaving poor Jacob Moore, like his great namesake, alone in his glory. Turning to the right, we scrambled up the spur of one of the mountains on the eastern side of the plain and thence dive down among the lateral valleys that run up between them. Although by this means we opened up quite a new system of hills and basins and gullies, the general scenery did not change its characteristics. All vegetation, if the black moss deserves such a name, ceases when you ascend twenty feet above the level of the sea, and the sides of the mountains become nothing but steep slopes of schist, split and crumbled, into an even surface by the frost. Every step we took unfolded a fresh succession of these jagged spikes and breakneck acclivities in an unending variety of quaint configuration. Mountain climbing has never been a hobby of mine, so I was not tempted to play the part of Excelsior on any of these hillsides, but for those who love such exercise, a fairer or a more dangerous opportunity of distinguishing themselves could not be imagined. The supercargo or owner of the very first Dutch ship that ever came to Spitzbergen broke his neck in attempting to climb a hill in Prince Charles's foreland. Berenz very nearly lost several of his men under similar circumstances, and when Scoresby succeeded in making the ascent of another hill near Horn Sound, it was owing to his having taken the precaution of marking each upward step in chalk that he was ever able to get down again. During the whole period of our stay in Spitzbergen, we had enjoyed unclouded sunshine. The nights were even brighter than the days and afforded Fitz an opportunity of taking some photographic views by the light of a midnight sun. The cold was never very intense, though the thermometer remained below freezing. But about four o'clock every evening, the saltwater bay in which the schooner lay was veneered over with the pellicle of ice one-eighth of an inch in thickness and so elastic that even when the sea beneath was considerably agitated, its surface remained unbroken, the smooth round waves taking the appearance of billows of oil. If such is the effect produced by the slightest modification of the sun's power in the month of August, you can imagine what must be the result of his total disappearance beneath the horizon. The winter is, in fact, unendurable. Even in the height of summer, the moisture inherent in the atmosphere is often frozen into innumerable particles, so minute as to assume the appearance of an impalpable mist. Occasionally persons have wintered on the island, but unless the greatest precautions have been taken for their preservation, the consequences have been almost invariably fatal. About the same period as when the party of Dutch sailors were left at Jan Mayen, a similar experiment was tried at Spitsbergen. At the former place, it was scurvy rather than cold, which destroyed the poor wretches left there to fight it out with winter. At Spitzbergen, as well as could be gathered from their journal, it appeared that they had perished from the intolerable severity of the climate, and the contorted attitudes in which their bodies were found lying too plainly indicated the amount of agony they had suffered. Summer excursions to Spitzbergen by steamer are now arranged for the accommodation of tourists. The Editor
End of section 95. This recording is in the public domain. Section 96 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 8, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 96, 1500 Miles of Floating Ice, 1871-1872, to by Hans Hendrik. Hans Hendrik, the author of the following narrative, was a native Greenlander. He became a member of four Arctic expeditions, under Kane, Hayes, Hall, and Nars, respectively. It was during the expedition under Hall that the events occurred which are here narrated. Before the Polaris had been at sea five months, Captain Hall died. Soon the ship was caught in the ice, and so terribly shattered by a storm that all expected her to go to the bottom at the next split. The only thing to do was to put as much of the stores as possible on the ice floe, in the hope that it would hold together until its occupants could be rescued. When nineteen persons were on the ice, a sudden split came, and they were separated from the ship. Then occurred the marvelous voyage of fifteen hundred miles, which is so graphically described by the Greenlander. Contrary to the expectation of all, the men on the Polaris managed to keep her afloat, and finally to bring her near the shore. During the winter they succeeded in making two boats with timber from the vessel. When summer had come, they sailed away in these towards the south, and were rescued by a whaler. The Editor After two days we stuck in the pack, and were brought down with it towards the south. While thus we were blocked, my comrade and I caught seals every day, and then began collecting a store of unskinned seals. At the same time, while the ship rested immovable, they put up a tent on the ice and filled it with bread. When we were off Cap Alikisat, a gale sprang up from the south. It was a pitch-dark night, when the ice began moving northward, and the floes were jammed and pushed over each other. At last our ship began to crack terribly from their pressure. I thought she would be crushed. On perceiving this, we brought our wives and children down upon the ice, and hurried to fetch all our little luggage, and remove the hull to a short distance from the ship. Then the ice broke up close to the vessel, and her cables broke. But in the awful darkness we could only just hear the voices on board, and when the craft was going adrift, we believed she was on the point of sinking. Here we were left, ten men, our wives and children, and the Tulloks, English or Americans, making nineteen in all, and having two boats, no boat remaining with the ship. When the others drifted from us, we thought they had gone to the bottom, while we ourselves were in the most miserable state of sadness and tears. But especially I pitied my poor little wife and her children in the terrible snowstorm. I began thinking, Have I searched for this myself, brought this upon myself by traveling to the north? But no, we have a merciful providence to watch over us. At length our children fell asleep while we covered them with ox hides in the frightful snowdrift. At dawn our commander Tasta said he would make for the land with the men as soon as their meal was done. When they had cooked and got their breakfasts, they set off towards an island called Piculek, but before they could reach the shore, they were stopped by new ice. About this time we sighted the ship, which was approaching us to our great joy. They steamed on, and I believed they would have observed us, but suddenly they turned, a heavy squall from the north coming on at the same time. When our Tuluk companions were going to make for the land, they asked us to follow them, but my comrade and I preferred to stay behind, knowing that they could not get to shore. 
The cook also kept us company, saying that he found it pitiful to abandon us. Those who tried to land returned after a while, not having succeeded. The north wind blew furiously, and the heavy seas threw us towards the westland. Suddenly the ice on which we dwelt parted, and we were separated from the tent which contained our store of bread. When the ice touched the westland it stopped, and packed together all round us. Here we made a snow hut. My comrade went out sledging, and how lucky he caught sight of the tent. Directly we started dragging a boat to fetch some bread. At the tent we filled the boat with bread, and drew it over the ice to our camping place. When we left our wives and children I was afraid a bear would devour them. Now I was consoled to see them unhurt, and after our arrival we had a good meal. Since we left the ship, this was the first time we ate sufficiently. The following day we deliberated whether we should remove to the floe where stood the tent, as it was very large and might serve us for an island during the winter. We resolved to proceed, and first brought thither one of the boats, loaded with bread and luggage, whereupon we filled the other in the same way. My wife and daughter loaded the sledge with our little properties and pulled it, my wife carrying the baby in her hood. Our son was seven years of age, our youngest daughter four, and these poor things walked over the rough ice, my wife and daughter pulling the sledge, and I assisting those who dragged the boat, a sad sight. When they were going to be left behind, I told my wife I should return to her. When we had brought the boat to our new camping place, I went back, followed by one of the sailors, and finding my little daughter Sophie Elizabeth very tired, we placed her on the sledge, and more men came to help us. When we had finished our removal, we turned the boat over, I and my family going to sleep under it, while the Tuluks were lodged in the tent, and the Westlanders made a snow hut for themselves. The next day we built a snow hut in the middle of the ice floe. Fancy, this was to be our settlement for the whole winter. One day we rested, then my comrade and I went out sledging towards the land. On approaching it we fell in with new ice. I remained to look for breathing holes, while my comrade proceeded towards the shore. I found some holes and heard the sound of breathing, but as the ice was covered with snow I could not get at the seals, which were scared by the noise. My comrade had been on shore and told me he had seen footprints of hares and foxes. When we returned, we made up our minds to remove to the land the following day. We also drove in another direction, but without discovering anything. Next morning we tried to go shorewards, but our island, the ice floe, began moving. It drifted seawards, consequently we turned back, and now we continued to be carried off incessantly, in a southern direction, throughout the winter. After some time, we caught sight of land, and by and by lost it again. Every day, my dear comrade, the Westlander John, and I went out hunting. In this way once we succeeded in getting a seal. What a joy when we had a meal of flesh, and our lamps became supplied with blubber. Afterwards I again got a seal, a small one. I killed it at one shot. Wonderful indeed, that we were so blessed with seals for our support, and that we so continued the whole winter. Once, when we were out shooting, I fell through, having both legs under water. My comrade asked, Are thou wet? I answered, No, I did not get wet. When we had tried shooting, we returned, but quite near to our encampment, a strong northern gale suddenly overtook us, and made both of us lose our way. The snow drifted terribly. As I was tired with walking, I stopped. Looking up towards the sky, I perceived many stars. Thereupon I proceeded, but came to a broad crack, and on going back I fell in with the open sea. Now I thought my last day was come. I considered the miserable position of my dear wife and children on a piece of ice in mid-ocean. Then I pronounced my prayer. Jesu, lead me by the hand, while I am here below, forsake me not. If thou dost not abide with me, I shall fall, 
but near to thee I am safe. When I had finished these words, I ascended a heap of ice blocks, and discovered a star rising a little above the surface of the ice. But it was my comrade who had lighted a torch, and pointed it all round from the highest part of the uneven ice. I went down in the direction of what I saw, but on my road I again fell in with a fissure, turned and went on, but again discovered something like a light. I moved forward examining it, but was again stopped by the break. While here some people were heard approaching, and when they came close they shouted, Are thou hands? I answered, Yes. Whereupon they said, We had nearly fired at thee, believing it was a bear. I answered, Never more I had reason to be thankful to anybody than to you, as I was quite unable to make out whither I had to go. When we came home, I found my wife and children had been most sorrowful, but I thanked the merciful providence on high. While we drifted in this way throughout the winter, my comrade and I frequently got a seal. Our lamps were never out for want of oil. When sometimes our supply was almost consumed, one of us used to catch. Just before Christmas, each of us took a seal, Christmas. During Jule, we finished all the provisions we had, except the bread, but we were consoled by knowing that daylight was near. When the sun reappeared, we fell in with a great many black guillemots. Of course, we also availed ourselves of them, as we were well off for guns. I had four myself, namely three rifles and one double-barreled fowling piece, and we had plenty of shot. These articles I and my comrade John had taken care to provide ourselves with when we left the ship. At first we only threw them down upon ice, then we brought them some distance from the ship. We could therefore afford to shoot Guillemots. Although the sun again shone, no land could be seen, and it was truly appalling to think that our Tuluk companions and our wives and children would probably starve. However, we were taken care of by Providence, and the whole winter were supplied with seals. While still we lived on our island of ice, we fell in with bladder nose and saddleback seals, and they gave us a good supply of food. As we advanced far south, we had a heavy swell, and in a pitch-dark night the floe, our refuge, split in two. At length the whole of it was broken up all around our snow-huts. When we rose in the morning and I went outside, the sea had gone down, and the ice upon which stood our house had dwindled down to a little round piece. Wonderful! There must be an all-merciful father. Some days after, when we had gone to sleep, we heard a gun fired. I went out and saw that a bear had been hit and had fallen. My comrade exclaimed, We have got a big bear, how cheerful! We shall now have bear's flesh. When we came still farther south, the ice appeared more dispersed, and at last we made up our minds to go in search of land, although none at all was in sight. At the same time we again met the heavy swell. We started in the boat, which was heavily laden. For some days we pushed on pretty well. When the seas came rolling, they looked as if they were going to swallow us up, for which reason, at intervals, we landed on ice floes. At length we made out land. Again we rested upon a piece of ice. During the night a heavy sea came on. We slept with our children in the boat, while the others used the tent. As the sea rose still higher, it began washing over our place of sojourn. They were obliged to remove the tent, placing it upon the top of an ice hillock, whereupon all of us had to keep hold of the boat. The children were placed in it, the women assisted us. When the sea began to move the boat, we all kept hold of the gunwales. The breakers looked as if they would engulf us. We exerted ourselves to the utmost each time, when the sea began lifting us. Whereas when it retired, we pushed the boat to remove it to windward, because there was a danger of our being washed down into the sea to leeward. We did not stop until we had brought the skiff close to the edge of the ice. But now the sea reached the tent which was placed on the hillock. To be sure, it was awful. Whenever the waves washed over us, 
we were in water up to the waist, while at the same time we clung to the gunwale, and all the while one heard nothing but exclamations. Now use all your strength. Towards morning the sea had abated, and when it grew light, we discovered that some smaller floes were less exposed to the swell. I spoke with my comrade about removing to one of these, and our commander Tarsta agreed. We put the boat into the water, loaded it, and went to a smaller ice floe, which we found much better, as it was not washed over. As the sea grew calmer, we pushed on. Seals were plentiful. We had no want of meat, and we used to take our rest on the floes. One night it happened that the ice which served us for our camping place parted between the boat on which I slept and the tent. I jumped out to the other side, while that piece on which the boat was placed moved off quickly with Mr. Mage, who was seated in the boat, and we were separated from it by the water. Our master asked the sailors to make a boat, raft, out of a piece of ice, and try to reach it, but they refused. We never had felt so distressed as at this moment, when we had lost our boat. At last I said to my comrade, However, we must try to get at it. Each of us then formed an umyard look, literally a bad boat, out of a piece of ice, and in this way we passed to other fragment. As now we were three men, we could manage to put the boat into the water. But when, on doing so, it sank forward, Mr. Mage fell into the sea. My comrade jumped into the boat at the same moment and pulled him up. I, being unable to follow, remained standing on the ice. When they had taken me along with them, we proceeded towards the others, but meanwhile the ice had screwed together and we stood still. We three men alone then hauled up the boat. At this time night fell, and our companions who had been in the sea and now was lying in the boat was like to freeze to death. I said to my comrade that if he remained so he would really die. If he could walk about it would be better. I had witnessed such a case before. When I had spoken thus, we asked him to rise, saying that if he remained, he would perish. The first time he rose, he tumbled down, but after having walked for a long time, he recovered. At daybreak, we discovered our friends close by, and the ice joined together. When first they had examined the road, they came to us and assisted us to drag the boat over to them. When we had started from this place, we were soon stopped by the pack and no live thing was to be seen. We began to be in need of provisions. We had no seal flesh left, and the next day our small stock of bread was to be shared out. In the night I had just fallen asleep, as I was to have my turn of the watch, when I was wakened by hearing people speaking about the bear. Rising up I saw a bear walking towards us. I said to the others that they must lie down near the boat, imitating seals, while my comrade and I went towards the bear, who alternately sank and reappeared behind the ice hillocks. We waited until he came close up to us, whereupon my comrade gave him a shot, and I finished him off. Thereupon the others joined us to drag him to the boat. How wonderfully did Providence bring us through the winter and give us supplies! At length we were off the remotest part of the Westland, whither the ice had brought us since last year. We left the ship in the far north. We were now near the country of the Tuluks, without having suffered any real misfortune. Before we had finished the last of our bear's flesh, the field opened, and we began catching seals, and sighted land, and when we proceeded towards it we fell in with the ship. Once in the afternoon, while still making for the land, we discovered a vessel steaming northwards. We tried to follow it, but night fell, and we stopped at the ice. At the same time, there rose a dense mist. During the night we showed two lights near the boat, making them pretty large, that people on board might observe us. After midnight I went to sleep when the others had risen. Towards morning I was awakened by hearing them talking about a ship, and when I got up I saw it emerging from the fog. I directly set off in my kayak, and when I came to them they questioned me, Who are ye? I answered, North Pole and Mutpolaris, Babelis. 
peoples. Then furthermore they asked, How do you do? Answered, Captain Hull died. Captain Hull died. Whereupon they said, Where is the ship? I answered, Last year we left it. On hearing this they said to me, Just follow a little alongside the ship. We will soon stop her. When we had come up to my companions, they lay to, to take them on board. I was the first who set foot on deck, then followed the others, and when all had come on board, it was as if we were ashore. The master of the ship and the crew altogether were exceedingly kind to us, and pitied us, who had spent the whole winter with our little children on a piece of ice. They gave us tobacco and pipes, and before all, a good meal. Their master, from mere kindness, was like a kinsman to us. End of section 96section 97 of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april 6090 california united states of america the world's story volume 8 norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the Search for the Poles, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 97. How to Build a Snow Hut by Roald Amundsen. In order to obtain a correct idea as to how a hut should be built in the most approved style, we will pay a visit to the master builder, a Ticklera. He is standing just below the summit of the ridge, beckoning to Nalungia, to intimate that he has found a suitable spot and that she is to bring him his snow shovel. A glance at the site he has selected shows that Atiklera is a practical man, as well as a man of taste. The position is well sheltered to the north, east, and west, and the crest of the ridge at the back will prove a barrier to the biting north wind. Towards the south, the prospect is open and will have the full benefit of the sunshine. Close by there is a small lake or pond which will supply the most delicious drinking water for the family. The country hereabouts consists mainly of spacious plains and beautiful lakes. Meanwhile, Nalungia has arrived with the snow shovel. This is made of a wooden board, which Atiklera has obtained by barter from tribes dwelling farther south, as there is no wood in the Chile, nor does the smallest piece of driftwood ever find its way to these latitudes. The shovel is made in a very workmanlike manner, and excellently suited for its purpose as long as the snow is loose. For hard snow, of course, our iron spades would be preferable. It is strengthened at the lower end with reindeer bone. Now, the first thing a Ticlera does is to shovel away the upper loose layer of snow in the circumference within which he had planned to erect his hut. He does so with a true eye, as the large number of huts he has built in his lifetime has given him good practice. Then he draws out the knife which has hitherto been suspended by a loop on the bone peg at the back of his anorak. It is quite a monster knife, enough to frighten any one who had not seen it before. The blade is as large as that of an ordinary good-sized butcher's knife, and is made of iron, which has also come from the south. The handle is about a foot long, and is of wood or bone. Taking the handle with both hands, he commenced to cut out his ice blocks for building the hut. These are cut out to a size about 18 inches wide, 24 inches long, and 4 inches thick. If cut out in this way, the building site itself will yield sufficient material for the whole construction. It is a pleasure to see how a good builder cuts each block so that it just fits where he sets it. A Ticlera is a veritable prodigy at this work. Not one of his blocks ever breaks in pieces, although he appears to cut them out without any particular care. Just a cut here and there, then a kick, and the thin, neat block stands separated from the mass of snow. All the blocks from a Ticlera's hand are so exactly equal in size that they look as if they had been accurately measured. The hut is built up in spirals in the form of a haycock or beehive, so that one layer of blocks rests on the previous one and extends a little further inward. In joining the blocks, the sides must be fitted to each other so that the walls are perfectly tight. 
the builder's skill can be gauged by the tightness of the hut but even with Atticlera's skill it is impossible to avoid some few small chinks here and there it is nalungia's task to fill up these chinks for this purpose she works the shoveled up loose snow until it is as fine as grated sugar for it is only when it is in this state that it can be used for making the joints tight it is thrown up against the blocks as soon as they are placed in position and fills in every little hole and crevice the walls of the hut rise quickly as the blocks are cut out the ground is cleared downwards and as they are set into their places they serve to increase the height of the walls of the cleared site Atiklera looks as if he had been standing on his head in a flower tub he is covered with snow all over his clothes hair and beard are white as chalk his long gloves prevent the snow from getting into the sleeves of the anorak building the roof of such a snow hut is a very complicated affair to the uninitiated many a snow block did i get on my head when i essayed this work the snow blocks have to be set back gradually inward and when the work is nearing completion the last blocks would appear to be literally suspended in the air without any base or support the last block or keystone which closes the roof in the center is quite small and in most cases triangular to fix it in its position from the outside it must first be juggled out through the hole which it is eventually to fill this looks impossible but the eskimo achieves the impossible with one hand he raises his block to the outside through the hole at the top and while holding it he cuts it into the shape of a wedge with a knife he holds in the other and when he lowers it into the hole it fits it as if it had been molded for the purpose nalungia aided by Herrera, has perseveringly plastered over the outside of the hut with fine snow so that it simply looks like a snow heap the outlines of the blocks are now quite concealed under the snow but the hut is perfectly tight as the fine snow works itself in wherever there is the slightest hole or crevice the master builder himself is not yet visible he is still busy in the interior of the hut where he is now completely built in at last his long-bladed knife protrudes from the wall of snow and with a rapid movement he cuts a hole just large enough for him to creep through i am surprised to see how high up the wall he cuts the hole as in all the huts i have hitherto seen this entrance hole was quite down to the floor now nalungia creeps in through the aperture and i follow her to see what she is going to do in the way of further internal arrangements i am at once enlightened as to why the aperture is made so high up atiklera has cut it on a level with the sleeping berth to expedite the work of moving in he has constructed the sleeping berth as follows he has first divided the hut by a row of snow blocks into two compartments of which the inner one is twice as large as the outer he throws all the loose refuse snow lying in the hut into the inner compartment until it reaches the level of the row of blocks and there you have the bedstead quite ready at the opposite end of the hut there is another small erection made of two blocks set on edge and a third laid across them like a table slab now commences the moving in through the aperture above the sleeping berth large quantities of skins are thrown in and slung topsy-turvy upon the sleeping place next comes all the furniture a drying grid water bucket cooking pot blubber lamp provisions blubber meat and fish and lastly the women's personal belongings which i dare not specify more fully now it looks as if all were over and mrs nalungia casts an inquiring look at me as much as to say are you going to creep out i have no idea what is about to happen but my curiosity prompts me to remain thinking that anything much worse than i had seen before was hardly likely to occur but i certainly was a little taken aback when the hole over the sleeping berth was suddenly blocked up again from outside and i was alone with one lady in a closed-up hut however as nalungia did not seem to mind it in the least why should i trouble disregarding me she set to work with a will the heavy blubber lamp was first raised upon the little snow table near the wall opposite the sleeping berth this lamp is made of a kind of stone they obtained from the utkohik cheliak eskimo it is carved in the form of a crescent and it is heavy and clumsy it is placed upon three pieces of bone inserted in the snow slab 
so that the inner edge of the crescent is turned towards the interior of the hut, while the outer edge is towards the wall. The blubber bag is now brought out, and a piece of frozen blubber taken from it. This is beaten with a specially made club of musk ox bone, until it is quite soft. Now she produces from one of her repositories a little tuft of moss, which she carefully soaks with seal oil. Ugh! I remember with horror those mysterious light pastilles. And then she sets to work to get a light by rubbing pieces of wood together. The pastille soon sends out the most dazzling rays. The crushed blubber is put into the lamp, and a wick of moss is laid along the hole of the straight inner edge. This is sprinkled with seal oil and ignited by means of the burning tuft of moss. The whole wick is now ablaze, and a brilliant flame lights up the roomy hut. I ask myself what in the world she wants with this brilliant flame, as she has now finished arranging the hut, and I am almost on the point of upbraiding her for this waste of precious oil, but I refrain, as I remember that an Eskimo never does anything without good reason. In fact, it soon becomes apparent that here, too, my judgment is premature. Gradually, an oppressive heat spreads from the mighty flame, and now I understand that her object is to cause the newly built hut to settle well down at the joints. As the result of the heat thus produced, the snow blocks gradually close up till they may be said to form one single continuous wall. While this is going on, Nalungia makes good use of her time and gets the sleeping berth into proper order. The waterproof kayak skins are laid next to the snow. These have been taken from the kayaks in the autumn and will keep the moisture of the snow away from the reindeer skins neatly arranged over them, and the sleeping berth looks quite cozy. Again she turns her attention to the lamp and trims the wick. This has to be done frequently. The saucepan is then filled with snow and suspended over the flame by two cords, secured to two bones fastened into the wall. The family may want refreshment after this job. The drawing grid made of reindeer bone, strung over with a network of sinew thread, is now fixed up over the saucepan, but not too near the fire. The skins will not bear too much heat. Finally. The anauda, a small round thick wooden stick with a handle used for beating the snow off the clothes is, by way of a finishing touch, driven into the wall. Everything is now ready, and none too soon, for at this moment a tiglura is calling from outside asking if he may come in. Nalungia casts a last critical look round the walls and tells him to wait a little. He goes off muttering something. Nalungia looks as though she meant to pay him out for his courtesy by keeping him waiting a little longer, and it is quite another half hour before she calls him in. Then an opening is made through the wall, right down to the floor, large enough for a man to creep through, and Atiklura's head appears through it. A moment later he is inside the hut. He takes off his soaking wet gloves, then throws them towards his wife, who turns them inside out and hangs them on the drying grid. Then she takes his coat, shakes it, and well beats it with the anauda, for it is important to remove very little grain of snow to prevent its melting and wetting the coat, which is then rolled up and thrown on the bed. The outer trousers are then treated in the same way, and placed with the coat next to the anorak. A tiklura stands there in his undergarb. This does not sound exactly comme il faut, according to our ideas, but it calls for no comment among the Eskimo. He now walks up to the sleeping place and sits down not as we might do on the edge, but well back so that he can rest his legs. Now the footgear must be removed, and this is not a very simple matter, as an Eskimo's footgear consists of five different articles. Outermost are the low reindeer skin shoes, made with the hairy side inwards. For a man of Atiklora's high descent, these are half-soled with seal skin. On the bottom of the sole there are some perceptible ridges which, on closer inspection, proved to be strips of skin sewed on to prevent the foot from slipping. Next come the kymics, which at this time of year are exclusively of reindeer skin. There are two pairs of these. The outer are made of the hide from the reindeer's leg, which is short-haired and very strong. They are made with the hairy side inwards and reach up to the knee, where they are laced up with a thong. Underneath these is another pair, exactly of the same length and appearance, but with the hairy side outwards. These are made out of the hide of a one-year-old reindeer taken from the abdomen, as the skin there is very fine and soft. Between these two pairs of kamiks, the Eskimo wears a pair of short reindeer skin socks, 
with the hairy side outward, and lastly, another pair of socks next to the skin with the hairy side inwards, so that altogether the feet have five different coverings. When I first saw this, I thought that, after all, we were rather more hardy than the Eskimo, as we only used three articles of footgear. But on my first laying tour, I realized that it was not simply for protection against cold that the Eskimo used all these articles, but, to a great extent, to protect the feet against the hard snow and ice on which they are always walking. With my triple footgear, I became so footsore that I could scarcely walk. Like the gloves, all the footgear must be put on the grid to dry. The inconvenience of skin clothing is that, unless kept well aired, it is very apt to absorb and retain any moisture. The Nichili Eskimo did not know of sedge grass. They put loose reindeer hair into their boots and take it out at night. This was better than nothing, but not nearly as good as our grass. When a Tiflura has removed his wet footgear, he puts on a pair of dry kameeks and a pair of low sealskin shoes, kameel litkin, corresponding to our slippers. In winter, these are used inside the hut only, but during the transition period between winter and spring, they are worn outside. As far as the care of the outer man is concerned, a Tiflura is now ready, and is therefore at liberty to think of the needs of the inner man. And these are not trivial. After the trying day's work, a fine salmon is served up, and all the members of the family partake freely. Frozen though it is, it seems to be highly relished, and very shortly there is nothing left but the clean-stripped skeleton. The saucepan now full of fresh, clean water and a few hundreds of reindeer hairs, of course are not looked upon as impurities, is emptied and refilled with snow and suspended again over the fire. Water is the only drink the Nichili Eskimo know. No, half and half of any kind is to be had there. They now announce that there is no more room in their stomachs for either salmon or water, and the meal is finished. It is now time to turn in. Nalungia prepares the bed for the night, arranging the beautiful soft skins. Atiklura closes up the entrance securely with a block of snow, slips in under the large family bed rug, and there disrobes. Unlike the Greenland Eskimo, these people of either sex never disrobe in the presence of strangers, except in the greatest emergency. The guest of the family is assigned a place at one side of the hut. Little and Nee and Area have turned in long ago, and the berth nearest the fireplace is reserved for Nalungia. She extinguishes the light and arranges her toilet in the dark. The large skin bed rugs are their only covering at night. Vigorous snoring soon announces that they are asleep. End of section 97. This recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Northwest Passage by Sir John Everett Millay. English painter, 1829 to 1896. Painting, page 518. It might be done, and England should do it. The search for the Northwest Passage arose from the wish to find a short way to China, and with this search the names of many celebrated navigators are connected. Among these are John Davis, William Baffin, John Ross, William E. Perry, Sir John Franklin, and many others. In 1854, Sir Robert McClure sailed partly through the passage, but was obliged to abandon his ship in Mercy Bay and join another expedition by a long sledge journey. The first complete voyage to the Northwest Passage was made by Roald Amundsen in 1902-1906. In the accompanying picture, a weather-beaten sea captain sits in a great armchair, listening to the stories of search for the Northwest Passage read to him by his daughter. Through the open window is a view of the sea. On the table behind him is his glass of grog and a telescope. Leaning against the table legs are the logbooks of former voyages. One of the pictures on the wall represents Admiral Nelson, the other a ship in an ice floe. At the right is a table whereon are flowers and the gloves of the young girl, but almost concealed by the national flag and a map of the polar regions. The captain's hands are clenched in the eagerness of his longing, 
and on one of them his daughter has laid her hand, as if to detain him from the quest. The model for the sea captain was Trelawney, the friend of Byron and Shelley. End of section 98. This recording is in the public domain. Section 99 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 8, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 99 Paying a Call in the Northwest Passage, 1906, by Roald Amundsen To some, perhaps, it may occur, that we could very well have done this survey under canvas, and that it was unnecessary to stop and retard our voyage on that account. This may be so, but it must not be forgotten that our position was not quite an ordinary one. Bearing in mind our running aground at Matty Island, we had quite decided not to risk a recurrence of that experience if we could possibly avoid it. We would rather sacrifice a few hours than jeopardize our vessel in these very hazardous waters, with a ragged stone bottom and shallow water under her keel, an unsafe compass and a small crew. We were, so to speak, standing on the threshold of our goal, attempted unsuccessfully by so many before us, and taking this into consideration, it was an easy task to restrain our impatience to get along as speedily as possible and out of our difficulties. At the first sign of daybreak we were at it again. We were compelled to keep southwards to avoid the shoals between the mainland and Douglas Island. The water was now getting deeper. Finding eventually that we had got far enough to the south, we turned off to the west, shaping our course towards the point where we expected to find an opening. It was an exciting time. Fortunately, the deep water continued. We found nowhere less than seven fathoms. We neared the mainland without trouble and found the passage all right. At 3 p.m. we passed Liston and Sutton Islands, and stood off into Dolphin and Union Strait. My relief at having thus got clear of the last difficult hole in the Northwest Passage was indescribable. I cannot deny that I had felt very nervous during the last few days. The thought that here, in these troublesome waters, we were running the risk of spoiling the hole of our so far successful enterprise was anything but pleasant, but it was always present to my mind. The whole responsibility for crew and vessel rested on me, and I could not get rid of the possibility of returning home with the task unperformed. The thought was anything but cheering. My hours of rest and sleep were principally spent during this time in brooding over such thoughts and they were not very conducive to sleep. All our precautions, and everybody's attention notwithstanding, any moment might have some surprise in store for us. I could not eat. At every mealtime I felt a devouring hunger, but I was unable to swallow my food. When finally we got out of our scrapes and I regained my usual calm, I had a most rapacious hunger to satisfy and I would rather not mention what I managed to dispose of. We could now discontinue the laborious watches of eighteen hours a day, and revert to the normal arrangement of six-hour watches. Barring a few small interruptions in the shape of fog and contrary wind, we made fair progress westwards. We did not sight Clerk Island at all, although the weather was clear, and it should have been well within the range of vision. Its existence would, therefore, seem somewhat doubtful. We encountered small lots of ice now and then, which reminded us that we were in the Arctic regions and must be prepared for eventualities. On August 26th, at 4 p.m., we sighted a high land to windward. 
the air was very misty, and as, according to our reckoning, we should be abreast of Cape Perry, I thought this was what we saw. During the early morning the air became clearer, and I knew then that this land was not Cape Perry on the mainland of America, but Nelson Head on Bering Island. The error was not quite insignificant, to be sure, but my misgivings on this head were appeased when told later by American whalers of the ludicrous mistakes they often made in these waters. There is probably a lot of iron in the mountains here, and the compass therefore becomes utterly distracted. Then there are strong currents, and the united influence of these factors may confuse the most conscientious navigator even more than it did when we mistook Nelson Head for Cape Perry. We were, of course, wholly unacquainted with the condition of things. When we had found our bearings, we continued our voyage at full speed, having a fair wind as well as the current right behind us. At 8 a.m., my watch was finished and I turned in. When I had been asleep some time, I became conscious of a rushing to and fro on deck. Clearly there was something the matter, and I felt a bit annoyed that they should go on like that for the matter of a bear or a seal. It must be something of that kind, surely. But then Lieutenant Hansen came rushing down into the cabin, and called out the weather memorable words, "'Vessel in sight, sir!' He bolted again immediately, and I was alone. The Northwest Passage had been accomplished, my dream from childhood. This very moment it was fulfilled. I had a peculiar sensation in my throat. I was somewhat overworked and tired, and I suppose it was weakness on my part, but I could feel tears coming to my eyes. Vessel in sight. The words were magical. My home and those dear to me there at once appeared to me, as if stretching out their hands. Vessel in sight. I dressed myself in no time. When ready, I stopped a moment before Nansen's portrait on my wall. It seemed as if the picture had come to life, as if he winked at me, nodding. Just what I thought, my boy. I nodded back, smiling and happy, and went on deck. It was a wonderfully fine day. The breeze had veered round somewhat to the east, and with the wind abaft and all sails set, we made excellent headway. It seemed as if the Gyoa understood that the hardest part of the struggle was over. She seemed so wonderfully light in her movements. Nelson Head was a long way off to the north. The flat-topped promontory looked grand in the morning sunshine, melting in the white snow, and throwing dark blue shadows into the parallel fissures of the mountainside. A heavy, bright swell rocked the vessel pleasantly, and the air was mild and soft. All this was observed in a moment, but it did not arrest our attention for long. The only objects between sky and sea that possessed any interest for us, then, were the two mastheads on the horizon. All hands had come, on deck, and all glasses were leveled at the approaching vessel. All faces were raised in smiles. Not much was said. One of the telescopes was lowered. I wonder and it was raised again. Another one lowered the telescope and also remarked, I wonder. On the appearance of the unknown vessel, we hoisted our Norwegian flag. It glided slowly up under the gaff, every eye watching it. Many pleasant words were whispered to the flag. It seemed as if everybody wanted to caress it. It had become a bit worn and ragged, but it bore its wounds with honor. I wonder what he'll think when he sees it. He'll think it is a venerable old flag. Perhaps he's an American. I shouldn't be surprised if he were an Englishman. Yes, he will see by the flag what we are. Oh, yes, he will see we are boys from good old Norway. The vessels were approaching each other very rapidly. There, up goes the American flag, sang out the watchman. He had the long telescope which had been placed on deck. This proved to be correct, and we could now all see the stars and stripes under the vessel's gaff. They had seen and recognized our flag by now, that was certain. Dense steam was issuing from the vessel's side, 
Evidently they had a motor, the same as we had, and were advancing rapidly. It was time now to tidy ourselves a little in preparation for the first meeting. Four of us were to go on board the ship, the other three had to remain on the yoa and look after our vessel. Our best clothes were hurriedly got out. We dressed ourselves according to our individual taste. Some preferred Eskimo costumes, and others our Norwegian russet. One found that sealskin boots looked best for the occasion. Others preferred ordinary sea boots. We also cleared up on deck as well as we could. The American could certainly scan our deck in every detail, from his crow's nest, through his telescope, and we wanted to make as decent an impression as possible. We were now so near each other that the whole ship was visible from our deck. It was a small, two-masted schooner painted black. She had a powerful motor, and the foam at her bows was spurting high. She also carried sail. We got the boats clear, hove to, and lowered the dory, the most seaworthy of them. It was certainly not much to look at, and the commander had no easy stern sheets with a flag to sit on. But the boat was in the style of the vessel to which it belonged, and we were not on a pleasure trip. The American had stopped his engine and was waiting for us. With two men at the oars we were soon alongside of him. A line was thrown down to us, I caught it, and was again linked with civilization. It did not, however, make its appearance in any great glory. The Charles Hansen of San Francisco did not seem to be rigged out in a very luxurious manner. A ladder, by the by, was superfluous, as the ship was deep in the water. We took hold of the chain whales and crawled on board. Our first impression was most peculiar. Every available space on deck was occupied to such an extent that it was nearly impossible to get along. Eskimo women in red dresses and Negroes in the most variegated costumes were mingling together, just as in a land of fable. An elderly man with a white beard advanced towards me on the quarter-deck. He was newly shaven and nicely dressed, evidently the master of the ship. "'Are you Captain Amundsen?' was his first remark. I was quite surprised to hear that we were known so far away, and answered in the affirmative, owning that I was the man. "'Is this the first vessel you have met?' the old man asked. And when I admitted it was so, his countenance brightened up. We shook hands long and heartily. I am exceedingly pleased to be the first one to welcome you on getting through the Northwest Passage. We were then most courteously invited down below to his cabin. There was not much room, though slightly more than on board of our own vessel, the Gyoa. Captain James McKenna, the master of the Charles Hansen, was a man of medium height, corpulent and between fifty and sixty years of age. That he was an old Arctic trader was evident from his looks. The deep wrinkles and copper-colored face told plainly of cold and murky weather. His personality was jovial and agreeable. He asked if I wanted anything, in which case he was ready to help us to the best of his ability. The only thing we missed so far was news from home, but unfortunately he had none. That is to say, he had some old newspapers, but old, yes, to you, to us they are certainly absolutely fresh. He brought out a bundle, and by a wonderful coincidence my eye first alighted upon a headline which made me stare. War between Norway and Sweden. I swallowed the article in hot haste, but it gave only a moderate amount of information. Captain McKenna had left home long ago and could give no more particulars. We sought further information all over the ship, but no one knew any more about it. This uncertainty was more unsettling than our previous ignorance, but it could not be helped. We had to put aside our anxiety and wait. After a very good dinner, Lieutenant Hansen and I began culling as much information as possible regarding the navigation ahead of us. McKenna was the senior of the American whalers and knew the North American coast better than anyone else. What we prized particularly was the set of American charts for the continuation of our voyage. They were of a more recent date than ours, 
and contained many new items. With marginal notes and indications of courses by the old, experienced captain, they were a real treasure to us. They were somewhat worn and tattered, and we therefore packed them up most carefully. Then about the condition of the ice, did he think we could continue in a westerly direction without hindrance? He told us that when inward bound he had been hampered by ice near Herschel Island, but that at the present late period of the season we were hardly likely to meet any obstacles of consequence. We should in any case reach Herschel Island quite easily. He was certain of this, and as he was himself going to winter on that island, it might happen that we should meet again. Before going into winter quarters he intended making a trip as far as Banksland to look for whales. So far he had been unlucky and got none. His motor was very powerful, and he would probably catch us up on his return voyage to Herschel Island. In addition he gave us every possible information about the waters ahead of us. It was pleasant to hear that the bottom along the whole coast westwards was even, and that we could navigate safely by the lead. We had not been spoiled by safe navigation, so we looked upon the remainder of our voyage as a mere pleasure trip. The breeze kept up well, and as I considered I could not afford to lose more of it, we said good-bye to our amiable host after a visit of two hours' duration. When leaving, he made us a present of a bag of potatoes and another of onions. As it was a long time since we tasted such luxuries, we gratefully accepted the gifts. We were awaited on board with eager expectation. For the present we agreed to look with great distrust on the reported war between the two United Kingdoms. The potatoes and onions became the center of joy, most of us being fond of these vegetables. We then dipped our flag, set all sail, and continued our voyage. McKenna proceeded eastwards to try his luck. End of section 99 this recording is in the public domain. Section 100 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Read for LibriVox.org. The Search for the Poles, Part 2. The North Pole. Historical Note. The first Arctic explorer of whom history makes mention was one Pythias, a Greek, who about 325 B.C. sailed as far as northern Norway. Another early explorer was Otar, or Othair, a Norwegian sea captain, who told King Alfred of England of a voyage into the White Sea about 870. Nearly four centuries ago, a deep interest was felt in the far north. For one thing, it was hoped that good fishing grounds might be found. Another reason was that several nations were eager to find either a northwest passage or a northeast passage to Asia. After better ways of reaching Asia than by a polar route had been discovered, the interest continued, and one nation after another took up the search. In 1818, a reward of $100,000 was offered by England for making the northwest passage, and $25,000 for reaching the pole. It is said that since 1800, 578 expeditions have been sent into the north, and our knowledge of the Arctic regions has steadily increased. In 1875, Nordenskold managed to slip through the Northeast Passage. The Northwest Passage was made in 1906 by Roald Amundsen, and in 1909, the long-sought pole was reached by Admiral Peary. End of Section 100 This recording is in the public domain. Section 101 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 8, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 101. The Fate of Sir John Franklin, 1849, by Elizabeth Doughton. 
Sir John Franklin went from England to the north four times on voyages of exploration and discovery. From his last voyage in 1845, he never returned. Between 1847 and 1857, thirty-nine relief expeditions were sent from England and America in the hope of finding the lost leader. It was finally learned that he had died in 1849. The Editor Away, away, cried the stout Sir John, while the blossoms are on the trees, for the summer is short and the time speeds on as we sail for the northern seas. Ho, oh, gallant crozier and brave Fitzjames, we will startle the world, I throw, when we find a way through the northern seas that never was found till now. A good stout ship is the Erebus, as ever unfurled a sail, and the terror will match as brave a one as ever outrode a gale. So they bade farewell to their pleasant homes, to the little hills and valleys green, with three hearty cheers for their native isle, and three for the English queen. They sped them away beyond cape and bay, where the night and the day are one, where the hissing light in the heavens grew bright, and flamed like a midnight sun. There was naught below, save the fields of snow, that stretched to the icy pole, and the Eskimo in his strange canoe was the only living soul. Along the coast, like a giant host, the glittering icebergs frowned. Or they met on the main, like a battle plain, and crashed with a fearful sound. The seal and the bear, with a curious stare, looked down from the frozen heights. And the stars in the skies, with their great wild eyes, peered out from the northern lights. The gallant crozier and brave Rich James, and even the stout Sir John, felt it up like a chill through their warm hearts thrill, as they urged the good ships on. They sped them away beyond Cape and Bay, where even the teardrops freeze, but no way was found by a strait or sound to sail through the northern seas. They sped them away beyond Cape and Bay, as they sought but they sought in vain, for no way was found through the ice around to return to their homes again. Then the wild waves rose, and the waters froze, till they closed like a prison wall. And the icebergs stood in the sullen flood, like their jailers, grim and tall. O oh God, O oh God, it was hard to die, in that prison house of ice. For what was fame, or a mighty name, when life was the fearful price? The gallant crozier and brave Fitzjames, and even the stout Sir John, had a secret dread, and their hopes all fled, as the weeks and the months passed on. Then the Ice King came, with his eyes of flame, and looked on that fated crew. His chilling breath was cold as death, and it pierced their warm hearts through. A heavy sleep, that was dark and deep, came over their weary eyes, and they dreamed strange dreams of the hills and streams, and the blue of their native skies. The Christmas chimes of the good old times were heard in each dying ear, and the dancing feet and the voices sweet of their wives and their children dear. But it faded away, 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 like a sound on a distant shore, and deeper and deeper grew the sleep, till they slept to wake no more. O oh, the sailor's wife and the sailor's child, they will weep and watch and pray. And the Lady Jane, she will hope in vain, as the long years pass away. The gallant crozier and brave Fitzjames, and the good Sir John have found, an open way to a quiet bay, and a port where we all are bound. Let the waters roar on the ice-bound shore that circles the frozen pole, but there is no sleep and no grave so deep that can hold a human soul. End of section 101。section 102 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the search for the poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. 
The World's Story, Volume 8. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 102. A Balloon Search for the North Pole. 1897. By G. Firth Scott. The expedition of Herr André is perhaps the most novel of all Arctic expeditions, inasmuch as it was undertaken by balloon. The idea which actuated Herr André in his enterprise was to utilize the current of air which, in July, almost invariably blows over Dane's island to the north. Being an experienced balloonist, he realized that, could he once rise into that current in a balloon, he would be carried right across the polar region in a few days. From the balloon car, he would be able to observe the character of the region below him, and set at rest the question whether perpetual ice, open water, or land occupied the extreme northerly spot of the world's surface. With two companions, Dr. Strindberg and Herr Frankel, and a specially prepared balloon, an attempt was made to get away in July 1896, but was unsuccessful, and the start was postponed for a year. In July 1897, the members of the expedition were again ready, and on July 11th they were cut loose and floated away out of sight to the north. Since then, no authentic news has been heard of them. They went away prepared to face a long detention in the frozen world. In the car of the balloon, they carried weapons, ammunition, and material wherewith to build a shelter, should the balloon collapse and leave them on the ice. An aluminum boat was also carried, so that the party could escape by sea if necessary. Several carrier pigeons were taken, and were to be liberated at intervals on the passage. But although one pigeon is said to have been shot in the far north, it is doubtful whether it was one of the Andre birds. The balloon, when it went out of sight, was traveling at a speed which would have carried it over the pole in a few days, and probably have enabled it to descend in Siberia in about a week. For the first fortnight after it had started, therefore, interest all over the world was keenly excited for further news. But the fortnight passed without any reliable intelligence being received, and a month followed, and so on, until a year had gone by. Then relief and search parties were talked about, and the Swedish Geographical Society sent one out to look for the missing balloonists in Siberia. It did not meet with Andre, nor did it obtain any reliable information respecting him. News was certainly published in every civilized country to the effect that some outlying tribes had come upon a huge bag, having a massive cordage attached to it, together with the remains of some human bodies. The Russian, Swedish, and Norwegian governments immediately sent forward auxiliary search parties, but their only success was to trace the origin of the report, and find that a Siberian trader had, in a moment of mischievous humor, hoaxed a too confiding telegraph agent. Later, on September 12, 1899, a Swedish sloop, the Martha, reached Hammerfest with the information that a buoy, branded with the name of the Andre expedition, had been found to the northeast of King Charles Islands. The buoy had lost the screw plug from the top, and had been so damaged by coming in contact with some hard substance that the interior cylinder was too dented to permit of an examination being made of the inside. Andre was well supplied with these buoys, and at any time one may be discovered containing a record of his doings from the moment he disappeared with his balloon sailing towards the north. It is not likely. It is scarcely probable that any sign will ever be discovered of the balloon or its occupants. For years, the frozen north held all traces of the Franklin expedition from the eyes of the searchers, who were able to conduct their operations along the route they knew Franklin had followed. No search party can knowingly follow the route Andre and his companions took. Their fate will probably be forever a mystery, for so many things might have happened that no one theory can claim for itself more probability than another. All that is certain is that the party went out of sight, drifting towards the north. They carried their lives in their hands, and knew that they did so. Had they succeeded, they would have achieved a mighty triumph. They failed, and in doing so, set their names as indelibly on the scroll of fame as any hero who has laid down his life in the contest with the measureless mystery of the pole. End of section 102
Section 103 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 8. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 103. The Attack of the Ice. 1893. By Fridjof Nansen. Fridjof Nansen, of Christiania, Norway, was trained as a zoologist and expected to become one, but a trip to the waters of East Greenland in search of specimens aroused in him an intense interest in the far north. A few years later he made the first journey across Greenland, and spent a winter among the natives of that country. He had a theory that a ship setting out from above Siberia would drift across the pole, and in 1893 he set out in the Fram, forward, to test its truth. For six months he drifted as he had hoped. Then he and one companion left the vessel and with dog sleds pushed on northward. He came within 272 miles of the pole a point 184 miles nearer than had been reached before. The following article pictures one of his experiences while the Fram was drifting. The Editor Friday, January 4th The ice kept quiet during the night, but all day with some intervals it has been crackling and settling, and this evening there have been several fits of pressure from nine o'clock onward. For a time it came on, sometimes rather lightly, at regular intervals sometimes with a rush and a regular roar. Then it subsided somewhat, and then it roared anew. Meanwhile, the pressure ridge towers higher and higher and bears right down upon us slowly, while the pressure comes on at intervals only and more quickly when the onset continues for a time. One can actually see it creeping nearer and nearer, and now at one o'clock at night. It is not many feet, scarcely five, away from the edge of the snow drift on the port side near the gangway, and thence to the vessel is scarcely more than ten feet, so that it will not be long now before it is upon us. Meanwhile the ice continues to split, and the solid mass in which we are embedded grows less and less, both to port and starboard. Several fissures extend right up to the Fram. As the ice sinks down under the weight of the ridge on the port side, and the Fram lists more that way, more water rushes up over the new ice, which has frozen on the water that rose yesterday. This is like dying by inches. Slowly but surely, the baleful ridge advances, and it looks as if it means going right over the rail. But if the Fram will only oblige us by getting free of the ice, she will, I am confident, extricate herself yet. Even though matters look rather awkward at present, we shall probably have a hard time of it, however, before she can break loose, if she does not do so at once. I have been out and had a look at the ridge, and seen how surely it is advancing. I have looked up the fissures in the ice, and noted how they are forming and expanding round the vessel. I have listened to the ice crackling and crunching underfoot, and I do not feel much disposed to turn into my berth before I see the Fram quite released. As I sit here now, I hear the ice making a fresh assault, and roaring and packing outside, and I can tell that the ridge is coming nearer. This is an ice pressure with a vengeance, and it seems as if it would never cease. I do not think there is anything more that we can do now. All is in readiness for leaving the vessel, if need be. Today, the clothing, etc., was taken out and placed ready for removal in separate bags for each man. It is very strange. There is certainly a possibility that all our plans may be crossed by unforeseen events, although it is not very probable that this will happen. As yet, I feel no anxiety in that direction, only I should like to know whether we are really to take everything on to the ice or not. However, it is past one o'clock, and I think the most sensible thing to do would be to turn in and sleep. The watch has orders to call me when the hummock reaches the Fram. It is lucky it is moonlight now so that we are able to see something of all this abomination. The day before yesterday we saw the moon for the first time, just above the horizon. Yesterday it was shining a little, 
and now we have it both day and night a most favorable state of things but it is nearly two o'clock and i must go to sleep now the pressure of the ice i can hear is stronger again saturday january fifth to-night everybody sleeps fully dressed and with the most indispensable necessaries either by his side or secure to his body ready to jump on the ice at the first warning all other requisites such as provisions clothing sleeping bags etc etc have been brought out on the ice we have been at work at this all day and have got everything into perfect order and are now quite ready to leave if necessary which however i do not believe will be the case though the ice pressure has been as bad as it could be i slept soundly woke up only once and listened to the crunching and jamming and grinding till i fell asleep again i was called at five thirty in the morning by Sverdrup, who told me that the hummock had now reached the fram and was bearing down on us violently reaching as high as the rail i was not left in doubt very long as hardly had i opened my eyes when i heard a thundering and crashing outside in the ice as if doomsday had come i jumped up there was nothing left for it but to call all hands to put all remaining provisions on the ice and then put all our furs and other equipment on deck so that they could be thrown overboard at a moment's notice if necessary thus the day passed but the ice kept quiet last of all the petroleum launch which was hanging in the davits on the port side was lowered and was dragged towards the great hummock at about eight o'clock in the evening when we thought the ice pressure had subsided it started thundering and crashing again worse than ever i hurried up masses of snow and ice rushed on us high above the rail amidships and over the tent peter who also came up seized a spade and rushed forward outside the awning as far as the forepart of the half-deck and stood in the midst of the ice digging away and i followed to see how matters stood i saw more than i cared to see it was hopeless to fight that enemy with a spade i called out to peter to come back and said we had better see to getting everything out on to the ice hardly had i spoken when it pressed on again with renewed strength and thundered and crashed and as peter said and laughed till he shook again nearly sent both me and the spade to the deuce i rushed back to the main deck on the way i met mogstad who hurried up spade in hand and sent him back running forward under the tent towards the ladder i saw that the tent roof was bent down under the weight of the masses of ice which were rushing over it and crashing in over the rail and bulwarks to such an extent that i expected every moment to see the ice force its way through and block up the passage when i got below i called all hands on deck but told them when going up not to go out through the door on the port side but through the chart room and out on the starboard side in the first place all the bags were to be brought up from the saloon and then we were to take those lying on deck i was afraid that if the door on the port side was not kept closed the ice might if it suddenly burst through the bulwarks and tent rush over the deck and in through the door fill the passage and rush down the ladder and thus imprison us like mice in a trap true the passage up from the engine room had been cleared for this emergency but this was a very narrow hole to get through with heavy bags and no one could tell how long this hole would keep open when the ice once attacked us in earnest i ran up again to set free the dogs which were shut up in castle garden an enclosure on the deck among the port bulwark they whined and howled most dolefully under the tent as the snow masses threatened at any moment to crush it and bury them alive i cut away the fastening with a knife pulled the door open and out rushed most of them by the starboard gangway at full speed meantime the hands started bringing up the bags it was quite unnecessary to ask them to hurry up the ice did that thundering against the ship's sides in a way that seemed irresistible it was a fearful hurly-burly in the darkness for to cap all the mate had in the hurry let the lanterns go out i had to go down again to get something on my feet my finland shoes were hanging up to dry in the galley when i got there the ice was at its worst and the half-deck beams were creaking overhead so that i really thought they were all coming down the saloon and the berths were soon cleared of bags and the deck as well and we started taking them along the ice the ice roared and crashed against the ship's side so that we could hardly hear ourselves speak but all went quickly and well and before long everything was in safety while we were dragging the bags along the pressure and jamming of the ice at last stopped and all was quiet again as before but what a sight 
The Fram's port side was quite buried under the snow. All that could be seen was the top of the tent projecting. Had the petroleum launch been hanging in the davits as it was a few hours previously, it would hardly have escaped destruction. The davits were quite buried in ice and snow. It is curious that both fire and water have been powerless against that boat, and it has now come out unscathed from the ice, and lies there bottom upward on the floe. She has had a stormy existence and continual mishaps. I wonder what is next in store for her. It was, I must admit, a most exciting scene when it was at its worst, and we thought it was imperative to get the bags up from the saloon with all possible speed. Sverdrup now tells me that he was just about to have a bath, and was as naked as when he was born. When he heard me call all hands on deck, as this had not happened before, he understood there was something serious the matter, and he jumped into his clothes anyhow. A mudson, apparently, also realized that something was amiss. He says he was the first who came up with his bag. He had not understood, or had forgotten, in the confusion, the order about going out through the starboard door. He groped his way out on the port side and fell in the dark over the edge of the half-deck. Well, that did not matter, he said. He was quite used to that kind of thing. But having pulled himself together after the fall, and as he was lying there on his back, he dared not move, for it seemed to him as if tent and all were coming down on him, and it thundered and crashed against the gunwale and the hull as if the last hour had come. It finally dawned on him why he ought to have gone out on the starboard and not on the port side. All that could possibly be thought to be of any use was taken out. The mate was seen dragging along a big bag of clothes with the heavy bundle of cups fastened outside it. Later he was stalking about with all sorts of things, such as mittens, knives, cups, etc., fastened to his clothes, and dangling about him, so that the rattling noise could be heard afar off. He is himself to the last. In the evening, the men all started eating their stock of cakes, sweetmeats, and such like, smoked tobacco, and enjoyed themselves in the most animated fashion. They evidently thought it was uncertain when they should next have such a time on board the Fram, and therefore they thought it was best to avail themselves of the opportunity. We are now living in marching order, on an empty ship. By way of precaution, we have now burst open again the passage on the starboard side which was used as a library, and had theretofore been closed. And all doors are now kept always open, so that we can be sure of getting out, even if anything should give way. We do not want the ice pressure to close the doors against us by jamming the doorposts together. But she certainly is a strong ship. It is a mighty ridge that we have in our port side, and the masses of ice are tremendous. The ship is listing more than ever, nearly seven degrees. But since the last pressure, she has righted herself a little again, so that she must surely have broken away from the ice and begun to rise, and all danger is doubtless over. So after all, it has been a case of much ado about nothing. End of chapter 103. This recording is in the public domain. Section 104 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in September 2019. The World's Story, Volume 8. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 104. The Discovery of the North Pole, 1909, by Admiral Robert E. Peary. The discovery of the North Pole is much more than a mere matter of sentiment and goes far beyond the solving of a tantalizing academic problem. Its scientific results are of the utmost importance. Chief among them is the knowledge which it has given us of the American polar basin and the continental shelf. Scientists have discovered that neither continents nor islands rise abruptly from the depths of the ocean. There is around them a somewhat level submarine platform where the water is comparatively shallow. This platform has received the name of the continental shelf. 
how far it extended beyond the northernmost land in the american arctic no one could say a shelf of great extent would indicate according to the scientists the probable existence of a group of islands or possibly a continent far within the arctic circle deep water on the other hand would mean an unbroken polar sea this important question was decisively settled by peary fifty miles north of cape columbia he took a sounding that revealed a depth of six hundred sixty feet at about forty miles farther north the depth had increased to one thousand nine hundred fifty feet within five miles of the pole all his wire nine thousand feet was sent down in a vain attempt to reach the bottom the northern apex of the earth therefore is now known to be an ocean of vast depth besides collecting much valuable data of which geographical students have long been in need peary brought arctic travel to a science introducing methods that have been of profound value to all recent explorers he carried arctic sledging to its present proficiency perfected every detail of equipment and devised the most efficient machine that has ever invaded the mysterious polar regions much scientific work in the far north remains to be done and all future explorers must lie under great obligations to this man who has led the way who has shown how to plan and organize and equip how to provide for every contingency and how to make the delays difficulties and disappointments all contribute to a final success the editor i turned to the problem before me this was what i had worked for during twenty-two years for which i had lived the simple life for which i had conserved all my energy on the upward trip for which i had trained myself as for a race crushing down every worry about non-success now in spite of my years i felt in trim fit for the demands of the coming days and eager to be on the trail as for my party my equipment and my supplies i was in shape beyond my most sanguine dreams of earlier years my party might be regarded as an ideal which had now come to realization as loyal and responsive to my will as the fingers of my right hand four of them carried the technique of dogs sledges ice and cold as their heritage two of them henson and uta were my companions to my farthest north three years before two others egingwa and siglu were in clark's division which had such a narrow escape at that time and now were willing to go anywhere in my immediate party but were not willing to risk themselves again in any supporting party the fifth was a young man who had never served before in my expeditions but who was if possible even more willing and eager than the others for the princely gifts a boat a rifle a shotgun ammunition knives etc which i had promised to each of them who reached the pole with me for he knew that these riches would enable him to wrest from a stubborn father the girl whose image filled his hot young heart all had blind confidence so long as i was with them and gave no thought for the morrow sure that whatever happened i should somehow get them back to land i recognized that all the impetus of the party centered in me and that whatever pace i set it would make good if i played out it would stop like a car with a punctured tire i had no fault to find with these conditions my dogs were the very best the pick of one hundred and thirty-three with which we had left columbia almost all were powerful males hard as nails in good flesh but without a superfluous ounce without a suspicion of fat anywhere and what was better yet they were all in good spirits my sledges now that the repairs were completed were in good condition my supplies were ample for forty days and with the reserve represented by the dogs themselves could be made to last fifty pacing back and forth in the lee of the pressure ridge where our igloos were built while my men got their loads ready for the next marches i settled on my program 
I decided that I should strain every nerve to make five marches of twenty-five miles each, crowding these marches in such a way as to bring us to the end of the fifth long enough before noon to permit the immediate taking of an observation for latitude. Weather and open water permitting, I believed I could do this. If my proposed distances were cut down by any chance, I had two means in reserve for making up the deficit. First, to make the last march a forced one, stopping to make tea and rest the dogs, but not to sleep. Second, at the end of the fifth march, to make a forced march with a light sledge, a double team of dogs and one or two of the party, leaving the rest in camp. Underlying all these calculations was a recognition of the ever-present possibility of open leads and impassable water, and the knowledge that a twenty-four hours gale would knock all my plans into a cocked hat, and even put us in imminent peril. At a little after midnight of April 1st, after a few hours of sound sleep, I hit the trail, leaving the others to break up camp and follow. As I climbed the pressure ridge back of our igloos, I took up another hole in my belt, the third since I started. Every man and dog of us was lean and flat-bellied as a board, and as hard. It was a fine morning. The wind of the last two days had subsided, and the going was the best and most equable of any I had had yet. The flows were large and old, hard and clear, and were surrounded by pressure ridges some of which were almost stupendous. The biggest of them, however, were easily negotiated, either through some gap or up some huge drifts. I set a good pace for about ten hours. Twenty-five miles took us well beyond the eighty-eighth parallel. While we were building our igloos, a long lead formed to the east and southeast of us at a distance of a few miles. A few hours' sleep, and we were on the trail again. The weather was fine, and the going like that of the previous day, except at the beginning, when pickaxes were required. This, and a brief stop at another lead, cut down our distance. But we had made twenty miles in ten hours, and were halfway to the eighty-ninth parallel. The ice was grinding audibly in every direction, but no motion was visible. Evidently it was settling back into equilibrium, and probably sagging northward with its release from the wind pressure. Again a few hours' sleep, and we hit the trail before midnight. The weather and going were even better than before. The surface, except as interrupted by infrequent ridges, was as level as the glacial fringe from Hecla to Columbia, and harder. We marched something over ten hours, the dogs being often on the trot, and made twenty miles. Near the end of the march, we rushed across a lead one hundred yards wide, which buckled under our sledges, and finally broke, as the last sledge left it. We stopped in sight of the eighty-ninth parallel, in a temperature of forty degrees below. Again a scant sleep, and we were on our way once more and across the eighty-ninth parallel. This march duplicated the previous one as to weather and going. The last few hours it was on young ice. Occasionally the dogs were galloping, and we made twenty-five miles or more. The air, the sky, and the bitter wind, burning the face till it crackled, reminded me of the great interior ice cap of Greenland. Even the natives complained of the bitter air. It was as keen as frozen steel. A little longer sleep than the previous ones had to be taken here, as we were all in need of it. Then on again. Up to this time, with each successive march, my fear of an impassable lead had increased. At every inequality of the ice I found myself hurrying breathlessly forward, fearing that it marked a lead, and when I arrived at the summit, I would catch my breath with relief, only to find myself hurrying on in the same way as the next one. But on this march, by some strange shift of feeling, this fear fell from me completely. The weather was thick, 
but it gave me no uneasiness, as before turning in I had taken an observation which indicated our position as 89.25. A dense, lifeless pall hung overhead. The horizon was black and the ice beneath was a ghastly, chalky white, with no relief, a striking contrast to the glimmering, sunlit ice-fields over which we had been travelling for the previous four days. The going was even better, and there was scarcely any snow on the hard, granular, last summer's surface of the old floes, dotted with the sapphire ice of the previous summer's lakes. A rise in temperature to fifteen degrees below zero reduced the friction of the sledges, and gave the dogs the appearance of having caught the spirits of the party. The more sprightly ones, as they went along with tightly curled tails, frequently tossed their heads, with short, sharp barks and yelps. In twelve hours we made thirty miles. There was no sign of a lead in this march. I have now made my five marches, and it was in time for a hasty noon observation through a temporary break in the clouds, which indicated our position as 89.57. I quote an entry from my journal some hours later. The pole at last! The prize of three centuries, my dream and goal for twenty years, mine at last. I cannot bring myself to realize it. It all seems so simple and commonplace. As Bartlett said when turning back, when speaking of his being in this exclusive regions, which no mortal had ever penetrated before, it is just like every day. The thirty hours at the pole were spent in taking observations, in going some ten miles beyond our camp, and some eight miles to the right of it, in taking photographs, planting my flags, depositing my records, studying the horizon with my telescope for possible land, and searching for a practicable place to make a sounding. Ten hours after our arrival the clouds cleared before a light breeze from our left, and from that time, until our departure in the afternoon of April 7, the weather was cloudless and flawless. The minimum temperature during the thirty hours was thirty-three degrees below zero, the maximum eleven degrees below. We had reached the goal, but the return was still before us. It was essential that we reach the land before the next spring tides, and we must strain every nerve to do this. I had a brief talk with my men. From now on it was to be big travel, little sleep, and a hustle every minute. We would try, I told them, to double march on the return, that is, to start and cover one of our northward marches, make tea and eat our luncheon in the igloos, then cover another march, eat and sleep a few hours, and repeat this daily. As a matter of fact, we nearly did this, covering regularly on our homeward journey five outward marches in three return marches. Just as long as we could hold the trail, we could double our speed, and we need waste no time in building new igloos. Every day that we gained on the return lessened the chances of a gale destroying the trail. Just above the 87th parallel was a region some fifty miles wide, which caused me considerable uneasiness. Twelve hours of strong easterly, westerly, or southerly wind would make this region an open sea. In the afternoon of the seventh we started on our return, having double-fed the dogs, repaired the sledges for the last time, and discarded all our spare clothing to lighten the loads. Five miles from the pole a narrow crack filled with recent ice, through which we were able to work a hole with a pickaxe, enabled me to make a sounding. All my wire, fifteen hundred fathoms, was sent down, but there was no bottom. In pulling up, the wire parted a few fathoms from the surface, and lead and wire went to the bottom. Three marches brought us back to the igloos where the captain turned back. The last march was in the wild sweep of a northerly gale, with drifting snow, and the ice rocking under us as we dashed over it. South of where Marvin had turned back, we came to where his party had built several igloos while delayed by open leads. 
Still farther south, we found where the captain had been held up by an open lead and obliged to camp. Fortunately, the movement of these leads was simply open and shut, and there had been no lateral motion to fault the trail seriously. While the captain, Marvin, and, as I found out later, Borup, had been delayed by open leads, we seemed to bear a potent charm, and at no single lead were we delayed more than a couple of hours. Sometimes the ice was fast and firm enough to carry us across, sometimes a short detour, sometimes a brief halt for the lead to close, sometimes an improvised ferry on an ice cake, enabled us to keep the trail without difficulty down to the tenth outward march. There the trail disappeared completely, and the entire region was unrecognizable. Where on the outward journey had been narrow cracks, there were now broad leads, one of them over five miles in width, caught over with young ice. Here again fortune favoured us, and no pronounced movement of the ice having taken place since the captain passed, we had his trail to follow. We picked up the old trail again north of the seventh igloos, followed it beyond the fifth, and at the big lead lost it finally. From here we followed the captain's trail, and on April 23rd our sledges passed up the vertical edge of the glacier fringe, a little west of Cape Columbia. When the last sledge came up, I thought my Eskimos had gone crazy. They yelled and called and danced themselves helpless. As Uta sat down on his sledge, he remarked in Eskimo, The devil is asleep, or having trouble with his wife, or we never should have come back so easily. A few hours later we arrived at Crane City under the bluffs of Cape Columbia, and after putting four pounds of pemmican into each of the faithful dogs to keep them quiet, we had at last our chance to sleep. Never shall I forget that sleep at Cape Columbia. It was sleep, sleep, then turn over and sleep again, with never a thought of the morrow or of impassable black leads. Cold water to a parched throat is nothing compared with sleep to a fatigue-numbed brain and body. Two days we spent here in sleeping and drying our clothes. Then for the ship. Our dogs, like ourselves, had not been hungry when we arrived, but simply lifeless with fatigue. They were different animals now, and the better ones among them stepped out with tightly curled tails and uplifted heads, and their iron legs treading the snow with piston-like regularity. We reached Hecla in one march, and the Roosevelt in another. When we got to the Roosevelt, I was staggered by the news of the fatal mishap to Marvin. He had been either less cautious or less fortunate than the rest of us, and his death emphasized the risk to which we had all been subjected, for there was not one of us but had been in the leads at some time during the journey. The big lead, cheated of its prey three years before, had at last gained its human victim. The rest can be quickly told. Macmillan and Borup had started for the Greenland coast to deposit caches for me. As soon as I arrived, an Eskimo courier from me overtook them with instructions that the caches were no longer needed, and that they were to concentrate their energies on tidal observations and soundings, at Cape Morris K. Jessup and north from there. These instructions were carried out, and after their return in the latter part of May, Macmillan made some further tidal observations at other points. The supplies remaining at the various caches were brought in, and on July 18th the Roosevelt left her winter quarters and was driven out into the channel pack off Cape Union. She fought her way south in the center of the channel and passed Cape Sabine on August 8th, or thirty-nine days earlier than in 1908, and thirty-two days earlier than the British expedition in 1876. We picked up Whitney and my party and the stores at Eta. We killed seventy-odd walrus for my Eskimos, whom I landed at their homes. We met the genie of Saunders Island and took over her coal, and cleared from Cape York on August 26th, one month earlier than in 1906. 
On September 5 we arrived at Indian Harbour, whence the message, Stars and Stripes Nailed to North Pole, was sent vibrating southward through the crisp Labrador air. The culmination of long experience, a thorough knowledge of the conditions of the problem, gained in the last expedition, together with a new type of sledge which reduced the work of both dogs and driver, and a new type of camp cooker which added to the comfort and increased the hours of sleep of the members of the party, combined to make the present expedition an agreeable improvement upon the last in respect to the rapidity and effectiveness of its work, and the lessened discomfort and strain upon the members of the party. Peary here speaks in praise of the members of the party and of the special work of each. As for my faithful Eskimos, I have left them with ample supplies of dark, rich walrus meat and blubber for their winter, with coffee, sugar, biscuits, guns, rifles, ammunition, knives, hatchets, traps, etc., and for the splendid four who stood beside me at the pole, a boat and tent each to requite them for their energy and the hardship and toil they underwent to help their friend Peary to the North Pole. But all of this, the dearly bought years of experience, the magnificent strength of the Roosevelt, the splendid energy and enthusiasm of my party, the loyal faithfulness of my Eskimos, would have gone for naught but for the sinews of war furnished so loyally by the members and friends of the Peary Arctic Club. Footnote. The Peary Arctic Club is the organization which made Peary's attainment of the pole possible. Its president is General Thomas H. Hubbard, Vice President Zenas Crane, Secretary and Treasurer Herbert L. Bridgman. End footnote. And it is no detraction from the living to say that to no single individual has the final result been more signally due than to my friend, the late Morris K. Jessup, the first president of the club. Their assistance has enabled me to tell the last of the great earth stories, the story the world has been waiting to hear for three hundred years, the story of the discovery of the North Pole. End of section 104。section 105 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the search for the poles. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Admiral Peary in his North Pole costume. Photograph, page 546. Robert E. Peary was born at Crescent Springs, Pennsylvania, in 1856. He became a civil engineer in the Navy in 1881, and later was engineer-in-chief of the Nicaragua Ship Canal Surveys. In 1886 he made a reconnaissance of the Greenland inland ice cap east of Disco Bay. His thoughts turned towards the north and now, with the instincts of the born explorer and the skill of a trained mind, he gave his spare time to the problem of preparations for Arctic research. No detail of the subject was too small for his closest attention and his most careful thought. In 1891-92 he made a brilliant record for explorations in Greenland. He discovered and named Melville Island and Heilprin Land, and solved in the affirmative the long-debated question whether Greenland was an island. Voyage followed voyage. He investigated the Arctic Highlanders, discovered the half-mythical Iron Mountain, and found it to be three enormous meteorites which he brought to New York. He rounded the northern extremity of Greenland archipelago, and at length reached in 1906 87 degrees 6 minutes north latitude, which was then furthest north. All this was by way of preparation for his greatest achievement, the discovery of the North Pole, which he himself has described so vividly in the following article. He tells of his success quietly and simply, and, as has been well said, his account 
will live as a piece of strong vivid and dramatic writing of fine literary quality and of permanent historic interest end of section 105 this recording is in the public domain section 106 of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles read for LibriVox.org. the search for the poles part three the south pole historical note far less interest was felt in the south pole than in the north as early as 1600 it was known that at 64 degrees south there was a rocky coast but no one seemed to care particularly about any further knowledge of it and during more than 200 years few expeditions sailed to the Antarctic regions. In the 19th century, the British government sent out Sir James C. Ross with the Erebus and the Terror, vessels whose names were given to two of the Antarctic volcanoes. Toward the end of the century, people began to be more desirous of knowledge of the extreme south, and expeditions were sent out by England, Germany, Sweden, Australia, Norway, Japan, and other countries besides those sent by private individuals. The prize, however, of being first at the South Pole was won by Roald Amundsen. He set sail in Nansen's vessel, the Fram, which had already done much good service in the north, and at the end of 1911 the Norwegian flag floated at the South Pole, as that of the United States had already floated at the north. End of section 106. This recording is in the public domain. Section 107 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 8, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 107 in Antarctic Winter Quarters, 1908 through 1909, by Sir Ernest H. Shackleton. The British Antarctic Expedition, led by Sir Ernest H. Shackleton, pushed on to within 111 statute miles of the South Pole. This expedition had well profited by the experiences of its predecessors. It was provided with Manchurian ponies, an automobile specially built for journeying over the ice, an acetylene gas plant, a printing press, a supply of books, and a store of food carefully planned to provide a thoroughly healthful nourishment in a small bulk. Indeed, so far as previous arrangements could make it, this journey was, compared with the earlier expeditions, a truly Luxurious Pilgrimage The Editor The inside of the hut was not long in being fully furnished, and a great change it was from the bare shell of our first days of occupancy. The first thing done was to peg out a space for each individual, and we saw that the best plan would be to have the space allocated in sections, allowing two persons to share one cubicle. This space for two men amounted to six feet six inches in length and seven feet in depth from the wall of the hut towards the center. There were seven of these cubicles, and a space for the leader of the expedition, thus providing for the fifteen who made up the shore party. One of the most important parts of the interior construction was the dark room for the photographers. We were very short of wood, so cases of bottled fruit, which had to be kept inside the hut, to prevent them freezing, were utilized for building the walls. The dark room was constructed in the left-hand corner of the hut as one entered, and the fruit cases were turned with their lids facing out, so that the contents could be removed without demolishing the walls of the building. These cases, as they were emptied, were turned into lockers, where we stowed our spare gear and so obtained more rooms in the little cubicles. The interior of the dark room was fitted up by Mawson and the professor. The sides and roof were lined with the felt left over after the hut was completed. 
Mawson made the fittings complete in every detail with shelves, tanks, etc., and the result was as good as anyone could desire in the circumstances. On the other side of the doorway, opposite the dark room, was my room, six feet long, seven feet deep, built of boards and roofed, the roof being seven feet above the floor. I lined the walls inside with canvas, and the bed place was constructed of fruit boxes, which, when emptied, served like those outside for lockers. My room contained the bulk of our library, the chronometers, the chronometer watches, barograph, and the electric recording thermometer. There was ample room for a table, and the whole made a most comfortable cabin. On the roof we stowed those of our scientific instruments which were not used, such as theodolites, spare thermometers, dip circles, etc. The gradual accumulation of weight produced a distinct sag in the roof, which sometimes seemed to threaten collapse as I sat inside, but no notice was taken, and nothing happened. On the roof of the dark room we stowed all our photographic gear and our few cases of wine, which were only drawn upon on special occasions, such as midwinter day. The acetylene gas plant was set up on a platform between my room and the dark room. We had tried to work it from the porch, but the temperature was so low that the water froze and the gas would not come, so we shifted it inside the hut and had no further trouble. Four burners, including a portable standard light in my room, gave ample illumination. The simplicity and portability of the apparatus and the high efficiency of the light represented the height of luxury under polar conditions, and did much to render our sojourn more tolerable than would have been possible in earlier days. The particular form that we used was supplied by Mr. Morrison, who had been chief engineer on the morning on her voyage to the relief of the discovery. The only objectionable feature, due to having the generating plant in our living room, was the unpleasant smell given off when the carbide tanks were being recharged. But we soon got used to this, though the daily charging always drew down strong remarks on the unlucky head of Day, who had the acetylene plant especially under his charge. He did not have a hitch with it all the time. Flexible steel tubes were carried from the tank, and after being wound round the beams of the roof, served to suspend the lights at the required position. A long ridge of wire rope was stretched from one end of the hut to the other on each side, seven feet out from the wall. Then at intervals of six feet, another wire was brought out from the wall of the hut and was made fast to the fore and aft wire. These lines marked the boundaries of the cubicles, and sheets of duck sewn together hung from them, making a good division. Blankets were served out to hang in the front of the cubicle, in case the inhabitants wanted at any time to sport their oak. As each of the cubicles had distinctive features in the furnishing and general design, especially as regards beds, it is worthwhile to describe them fully. This is not so trivial a matter as it may appear to some readers, for during the winter months the inside of the hut was the whole inhabited world to us. The wall of Adams and Marshall's cubicle, which was next to my room, was fitted with shelves made out of venesticasis, and there was so much neatness and order about this apartment that it was known by the address number one Park Lane. In front of the shelves hung little gauze curtains tied up with blue ribbon, and the literary tastes of the occupants could be seen at a glance from the bookshelves. In Adam's quarter, the period of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era filled most of his bookshelves, though a complete edition of Dickens came in a good second. Marshall's shelves were stocked with bottles of medicine, medical works, and some general literature. The dividing curtain of duck was adorned by Marston with life-size colored drawings of Napoleon and Joan of Arc. Adams and Marshall did Sandow exercises daily, and their example was followed by other men later on, when the darkness and bad weather made open-air work difficult. The beds of this particular cubicle were the most comfortable in the hut, but took a little longer to rig up at night than most of the others. This disadvantage was more than compensated for by the free space gained during the day, and by permission of the owners it was used as consulting room, 
dispensary, and operating theater. The beds consisted of bamboos lashed together for extra strength, to which strips of canvas were attached, so that each bed looked like a stretcher. The wall end rested on stout cleats screwed on to the side of the hut, the other ends on chairs, and so supported. The occupants slept soundly and comfortably. The next cubicle on the same side was occupied by Marston and Day, and as the former was the artist and the latter the general handyman of the expedition, one naturally found an ambitious scheme of decoration. The shells were provided with beading, and the Vanesta boxes were stained brown. This idea was copied from Number 1 Park Lane, where they had stained all their walls with Condy's fluid. Marston and Day's cubicle was known as the Gables, presumably from the gabled appearance of the shelves. Solid wooden beds made out of old packing cases and upholstered with wood shavings covered with blankets made very comfortable couches, one of which could be pushed during meal times out of the way of the chairs. The artist's curtain was painted to represent a fireplace and mantelpiece in civilization. A cheerful fire burned in the grate, and a bunch of flowers stood on the mantelpiece. The dividing curtain between it and Number 1 Park Lane, on the other side of the cubicle, did not require to be decorated, for the color of Joan of Arc and also portions of Napoleon had oozed through the canvas. In the gables was set up the lithographic press, which was used for producing pictures for the book which was printed at our winter quarters. The next cubicle on the same side belonged to Armitage and Brockleshurst. Here everything in the way of shelves and fittings was very primitive. I lived in Brocklehurst portion of the cubicle for two months, as he was laid up in my room, and before I left it I constructed a bed of empty petrol cases. The smell from these for the first couple of nights after ricking them up was decidedly unpleasant, but it disappeared after a while. Next to Brocklehurst and Armitage's quarters came the pantry. The division between the cubicle and the pantry consisted of a tier of cases, making a substantial wall between the food and the heads of the sleepers. The pantry, bakery, and storeroom, all combined, measured six feet by three, not very capacious, certainly, but sufficient to work in. The far end of the hut constituted the other wall of the pantry, and was lined with shelves up to the slope of the roof. These shelves were continued along the wall behind the stove, which stood about four feet out from the end of the house, and an erection of wooden battens and burlap or sacking concealed the biological laboratory. The space taken up by this important department was four feet by four, but lack of ground error was made up for by the shelves, which contained dozens of bottles soon to be filled with Murray's biological captures. Beyond the stove facing the pantry was McKay's and Robert's cubicle, the main feature of which was a ponderous shelf on which rested mostly socks and other light articles, the only thing of weight being our gramophone and records. The bunks were somewhat feeble imitations of those belonging to Number 1 Park Lane, and the troubles that the owners went through before finally getting them into working order afforded the rest of the community a great deal of amusement. I can see before me now the triumphant face of Mackay as he called all hands round to see his design. The inhabitants of Number 1 Park Lane pointed out that the bamboo was not a rigid piece of wood, and that when Mackay's weight came on it, the middle would bend and the ends would jump off the supports, unless secured. Mackay undressed before a critical audience, and he got into his bag and expiated on the comfort and luxury he was experiencing, so different from the hard boards he had been lying on for months. Roberts was anxious to try his couch, which was constructed on the same principle, and the audience were turning away when suddenly a crash was heard, followed by a strong expletive. McKay's bed was half on the ground, one end of it resting, one end of it resting at a most uncomfortable angle. Laughter and pointed remarks as to his capacity for making a bed were nothing to him. He tried three times that night to fix it up, but at last had to give it up for a bad job. 
in due time he arranged fastenings and after that he slept in comfort between this cubicle and the next there was no division neither party troubling about the matter the result was that four men were constantly at war regarding alleged encroachments on their ground priestley who was long suffering and who occupied the cubicle with murray said he did not mind a chair or a volume of the encyclopedia britannica being occasionally deposited on him while he was asleep but that he thought it was a little too strong to drop wet boots newly arrived from the stables on top of his belongings priestley and murray had no floor space at all in their cubicle as their beds were built of empty dog biscuit boxes a division of boxes separated the two sleeping places and the whole cubicle was garnished on priestley's side with bits of rock ice axes hammers and chisels and on murray's with biological specimens next came one of the first cubicles that had been built joyce and wilde occupied the rogues retreat a painting of two very tough characters drinking beer out of pint mugs with the inscription the rogues retreat painted underneath adorning the entrance to the den the couches in this house were the first to be built and those of the opposite dwelling the gables were copied from their design the first bed had been built in wild storeroom for secrecy's sake it was to burst upon the view of every one and to create mingled feelings of admiration and envy admiration for the splendid design envy of the unparalleled luxury provided by it however in building it the designer forgot the size of the doorway he had to take it through and it had ignominiously to be sawn in half before it could be passed out of the storeroom into the hut the printing press and typecase for the polar paper occupied one corner of this cubicle the next and last compartment was the dwelling place of the professor and mawson it would be difficult to do justice to the picturesque confusion of this compartment one hardly likes to call it untidy for the things that cover the bunks by daytime could be placed nowhere else conveniently a miscellaneous assortment of cameras spectroscopes thermometers microscopes electrometers and the like lay in profusion on the blankets mawson's bed consisted of his two boxes in which he had stowed his scientific apparatus on the way down and the professor's bed was made out of kerosene cases everything in the way of tin cans or plug topped with straw wrappers belonging to the fruit bottles was collected by these two scientific men mawson as a rule put his possessions in his storeroom outside but the professor not having any retreat like that made a pile of glittering tins and colored wrappers at one end of his bunk and the heap looked like the nest of the australian bower bird the straw and the tins were generally cleared away when the professor and priestley went in for a day's packing of geological specimens the straw wrappers were utilized for wrapping round the rocks and the tins were filled with paper wrapped round the more delicate geological specimens the name given though not by the owners to this cubicle was the pawn shop for not only was there always a heterogeneous mass of things on the bunks but the wall of the dark room and the wall of the hut at this spot could not be seen for the multitude of cases ranged as shelves and filled with a varied assortment of notebooks and instruments in order to give as much free space as possible in the centre of the hut we had the table so arranged that it could be hoisted up over our heads after meals were over this gave ample room for the various carpentering and engineering efforts that were constantly going on murray built the table out of the lids of packing cases and though often scrubbed the stenciling on the cases never came out we had no tablecloth but this was an advantage for a well scrubbed table had a cleaner appearance than would be obtained with such washing as could be done in an antarctic laundry the legs of the table were detachable being after the fashion of trestles and the whole affair when meals were over was slung by a rope at each end about eight feet from the floor at first we used to put the boxes containing knives forks plates and bowls on top of the table before hauling it up but after three had fallen on the unfortunate head of the person trying to get them down we were content to keep them on the floor i had been very anxious as regards the stove 
the most important part of the hut equipment when i heard that after the blizzard that kept me on board the nimrod the temperature of the hut was below zero and that socks put to dry in the baking ovens came out as damp as ever the following morning my anxiety was dispelled after the stove had been taken to pieces again for it was found that eight important pieces of its structure had not been put in as soon as this omission was rectified the stove acted splendidly and the makers deserve our thanks for the particular apparatus they picked out as suitable for us the stove was put to a severe test for it was kept going day and night for over nine months without once being out for more than ten minutes when occasion required it to be clean it supplied us with sufficient heat to keep the temperature of the hut sixty to seventy degrees above the outside air enough bread could be baked to satisfy our whole hungry party of fifteen every day three hot meals a day were also cooked and water melted from ice at a temperature of perhaps twenty degrees below zero in sufficient quantities to afford as much as we required for ourselves and to water the ponies twice a day and all this work was done on a consumption not exceeding five hundred weight of coal per week after testing the stove by running it on an accurately measured amount of coal for a month we were reassured about our coal supply being sufficient to carry us through the winter right on to sledging time as the winter came on and the light grew faint outside the hut became more and more like a workshop and it seems strange to me now thinking back to those distant days to remember the amount of trouble and care that was taken to furnish and beautify what was only to be a temporary home one of our many kind friends had sent us a number of pictures which were divided between the various cubicles and these brightened up the place wonderfully during our first severe blizzard the hut shook and trembled so that every moment we expect the whole thing to carry away and there is not the slightest shadow of a doubt that if we had been located in the open the hut and everything in it would have been torn up and blown away even with our sheltered position i had to lash the chronometers to the shelf in my room for they are apt to be shaken off when the walls trembled in the gale when the storm was over we put a stout wire cable over the hut burying the ends in the ground and freezing them in so as to afford additional security in case heavier weather was in store for us in the future end of section 107 this recording is in the public domain section 108 of norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world's story volume eight norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles edited by eva march tappan section 108 norway at the south pole 1911 by roald odmundson on the first of december we left this broken glacier with holes and crevices without number with its height of ninety one hundred feet before us looking in the mist and snowdrift like a frozen sea appeared a light sloping ice plateau filled with small hummocks the walk over this frozen sea was not pleasant the ground under us was quite hollow and it sounded as though we were walking on the bottoms of empty barrels as it was a man fell through then a couple of dogs we could not use our skis on this polished ice sledges had the best of it the place got the name the devil's dancing room this part of our march was the most unpleasant on december sixth we got our greatest height according to the hypsometer and aneroid ten thousand seven hundred and fifty feet at eighty seven degrees forty minutes south on december eighth we came out of the bad weather once again the sun smiled down upon us once again we could get an observation dead reckoning and observation were exactly alike eighty eight degrees sixteen minutes sixteen seconds south before us lay an absolutely plain plateau only here and there marked with a tiny sestrui 
a wind furrow in the snow. In the afternoon we passed 88 degrees 23 minutes. Shackleton's farthest south was 88 degrees 25 minutes. We camped and established our last depot, depot number 10. From 88 degrees 25 minutes, the plateau began to slope down very gently and smoothly toward the other side. On the 9th of December, we reached 88 degrees 39 minutes. On December 10th, 88 degrees 56 minutes. December 11, 89 degrees 15 minutes. December 12, 89 degrees 30 minutes. December 13th, 89 degrees 45 minutes. Up to this time, the observations and dead reckoning agreed remarkably well and we made out that we ought to be at the pole on december fourteen in the afternoon that day was a beautiful one a light breeze from southeast the temperature minus twenty three celsius nine point four degrees below zero fahrenheit and the ground and sledging were perfect the day went along as usual and at three p m we made a halt according to our reckoning we had reached our destination all of us gathered around the colors, a beautiful silk flag, all hands taking hold of it and planting it. The vast plateau on which the pole is standing got the name of the King Hakan, the seventh plateau. It is a vast plain, alike in all directions. Mile after mile, during the night, we circled around the camp. In the fine weather, we spent the following day taking a series of observations from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. The result gave us 89 degrees 55 minutes. In order to observe the pole as closely as possible, we traveled as near south as possible, the remaining nine kilometers. On December 16, there we camped. It was an excellent opportunity. There was a brilliant sun. Four of us took observations every hour of the day's 24 hours. The exact result will be the matter of a professional, private report. This much is certain, that we observe the pole as close as it is in human power to do it, with the instruments we had, a sextant and an artificial horizon. End of section 108. This recording is in the public domain. Section 109 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. At the South Pole. Photograph, page 574. The Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen was educated for a physician, but gave up medicine for the sea. His record as a discoverer includes the determination of the position of the magnetic pole, the achievement of the Northwest Passage, and the discovery of the South Pole. On his latest voyage, he planned to go to the North Pole, but while lying in Funchal Harbour, suddenly proposed to his men that they go to the South Pole instead. They agreed with enthusiasm. The following is his own account of the planting of his country's flag, in the frozen south. We proceeded to the greatest and most solemn act of the whole journey, the planting of our flag. Pride and affection shone in the five pairs of eyes that gazed upon the flag as it unfurled itself with a sharp crack and waved over the pole. I had determined that the act of planting it, the historic event, should be equally divided among us all. It was not for one man to do this. It was for all who had staked their lives in the struggle and held together through thick and thin. This was the only way in which I could show my gratitude to my comrades in this desolate spot. I could see that they understood and accepted it in the spirit in which it was offered. Five weather-beaten, frost-bitten fists they were that grasped the pole, raised the waving flag in the air, and planted it as the first at the geographical South Pole. Thus we plant the beloved flag at the South Pole, and give to the plain on which it lies the name of King Hawken the Seventh's Plateau. 
that moment will certainly be remembered by all of us who stood there. In this picture, the Norwegian flag is shown planted at the pole, while beside it stands Oscar Wisting, a member of Amundsen's party, with his team of dogs harnessed to the loaded sled. End of section 109 this recording is in the public domain. Section 110 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 8, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles, edited by Ava March Tappen, section number 110, The Rivals in the Antarctic, 1911, from Harper's Weekly. Roald Admundsen planted the Norwegian flag at the South Pole on December 14th last. 1911. At three o'clock in the afternoon, upon a vast plateau stretching away in every direction without a break in the monotony of its flat surface, the temperature was 9.4 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. In considering this comparatively high temperature, we must remember that the date was only a week before midsummer. Captain Odmundson knows nothing of the whereabouts of Captain Scott the commander of the rival expedition. England has not abandoned the hope that her flag was planted first at the pole, for the exact location of this geographical point cannot, of course, be determined absolutely by means of a sextant and artificial horizon, such as Admundsen carried, and there would be room for two flags to wave so far apart as to be invisible each from the other, yet each approximating to the site of the pole. However, the appearances are that Captain Odmundsen has won the race. The lowest temperature recorded was 76 degrees below zero on the Fahrenheit scale. Only two blizzards were encountered in place of the violent hurricanes which had been expected. A new range of mountains was found. Ever since the news arrived a year ago that Scott and Admundsen had met at the edge of the great ice barrier which surrounds the southern polar regions, the world had been awaiting news of the expeditions. The conquest of the North Pole had stimulated the interest of the world, and the successful outcome of this attempt to reach the southernmost point of the globe was believed to be inevitable. Never before had representatives of so many nations striven against one another for such a prize. Five expeditions were in the field, an English, a Norwegian, an Australian, a German, and a Japanese. But of these five, only the English and the Norwegian were believed to have any chance of success. The Australians, under the command of Dr. Mawson, sailed with a small ship, the Aurora, in November 1910. The German expedition, headed by Lieutenant William Filchner, left Buenos Aires on board the Deutschland on October 5, 1911. The Japanese, commanded by Lieutenant Shirasi, sailed on November 20th last from Sydney and, although poorly equipped, are believed to have pressed on toward their destination. At the onset, only the expedition of Captain Scott was thought to have a chance of attaining the South Pole. Odmundsen's plans originally were to attempt to reach the North Pole, and he had sailed with that purpose. But one hot night, while the Fram, Nansen's old ship, which they had adopted, was lying in Funchal Harbor, Madeira, Admetson proposed that they should alter their quest and sail toward the extreme opposite end of the world. The crew accepted his proposition with enthusiasm, and Scott found that he had a formidable rival, one, moreover, who had six months' advantage of him and seemed likely to anticipate him in implanting his nation's flag at the South Pole. But Admundsen's expedition was much less suitably equipped than his chief rivals. His main reliance was upon the hundred Eskimo dogs that he took to draw the sledges. His crew of nineteen men, moreover, had 
for the most part participated in journeys over the arctic ice packs on february fourth of last year scott found odmutson in the bay of wells at the edge of the antarctic ice barrier about seven hundred miles from the pole since then until his arrival at hobart no news of him was received the expedition of captain scott was far better equipped than that of his arrival the british government contributed the sum of one hundred thousand dollars and an equal amount was raised by public subscription it was scott's intention to profit by the experiences of lieutenant shackleton who had come to within ninety-seven miles of the pole a year or so before and to follow the same course that his predecessor had taken on june first nineteen ten he sailed from london in the terra nova a dundee whaler twenty-eight years old but refitted and remodeled with sixty men and a supply of stores sufficient for three years much of sir ernest shackleton's equipment had been copied and some had been improved despite the failure of shackleton to profit by his motor sleigh scott took with him two such sledges upon which he was placing much reliance one of these was lost in the landing at mcmurdo sound in january nineteen eleven according to the news brought back at that time he still had the other however a motor with driving wheels composed of hickory and steel and sledge runners for the front like shackleton he took manchurian ponies believing they could be depended upon better than dogs dogs however were to be used as well the motor sled when subjected to severe tests in norway had proved itself capable of covering from two to three and a half miles an hour it was to be the main feature of the transportation plans of the scott expedition scott's plan was to enter ross sea and sail to mcmurdo sound on the shore of victoria land landing there and marching across the ice barrier toward the pole the ice barrier extends between victoria land and king edward the seventh land for a distance of about two hundred miles this crossed there would be a toilsome ascent up what shackleton called the great glacier a distance of nearly a hundred miles after which would come the journey across the summit of the south polar continent at an altitude of ten thousand feet until the pole was reached like shackleton scott planned to divide his party one body consisting of lieutenant campbell and five men was to be sent east to attempt a landing on king edward the seventh land forming the eastern shore of ross sea while this land was discovered years ago nobody had ever been able to step foot on it because of the ice surrounding it as a matter of fact subsequent reports brought back by the terra nova last year showed that this party had failed in accomplishing its objective on account of the ice and had shifted the scene of exploration to victoria land the main party was to be led by scott himself and was to consist of at least sixteen men and possibly more at the start following the example of perry and other explorers however some of these men would be sent back from time to time as the journey progressed until a few would make the final dash for the pole at the pole scott intended to plant the two flags which had been presented to him just before he started by queen alexandra they were two union jacks the larger one to be hoisted at the pole if reached and then brought back and presented to her the other flag made of stronger texture it was planned to leave flying as a permanent record the antarctic has not been the scene of so much exploration as have the arctic regions among the earlier names linked with the discovery of the southern continent are those of the american wilkes whose discovery of wilkes land was disputed for many years and the englishman james clark ross it was the latter who after making his way through the pack ice with two sailing vessels the erebus and the terror in eighteen forty two came across the great ice barrier one hundred feet in height which for nearly fifty years was believed to be insurmountable it was not until nineteen hundred that karsten borschkrevink a norwegian found an opening in the huge wall of ice and entered it he then discovered that a wide expanse of land over which travel was plainly possible lay behind it 
Captain Scott, following him, succeeded in penetrating McMurdo Strait. In 1908, Shackleton reached a latitude of 88 degrees 23 minutes, and would have reached the pole but for the loss of a pony laden with supplies. Shackleton found that the land was the most desolate in the world, containing no animal life except a single species of flea. Roald Amundsen, the conqueror of the pole, is about 40 years of age. He is a graduate of the University of Christiania, but after taking his doctor's degree, he abandoned medicine to follow the sea as his forebears had done for generations. In 1903, he effected the conquest of the Northwest Passage in a little sloop called the Goja, manned by seven men, a feat which had been attempted vainly by many since Franklin's voyage, and had involved the loss of many ships and men. End of section 110. This recording is in the public domain. Section 111 of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonja. The World Story, Volume 8. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Greenland, and the Search for the Poles. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 111 Captain Scott's Last Message, 1912 By Robert F. Scott Captain Scott, in command of the British South Polar Expedition, succeeded in reaching his goal on January 18, 1912. On his return, weakened by need of food, he was overtaken by a blizzard only eleven miles from the camp where fuel and provisions had been deposited. The following message was written by him shortly before his death, and was found by the relief expedition some months later. The Editor The causes of this disaster are not due to faulty organization, but to misfortune in all the risks that had to be undertaken. 1. The loss of pony transport in March 1911 obliged me to start later than I had intended, and obliged the limits of stuff transported to be narrowed. The weather throughout the outward journey and especially the long gale in eighty-three degrees south, stopped us. The soft snow in the lower reaches of the glacier again reduced the pace. We fought these untoward events with will, and conquered, but it ate into our provisions reserve. Every detail of our food supplies, clothing, and depots made on the interior ice sheet and on that long stretch of seven hundred miles to the pole and back, worked out to perfection. The advance party would have returned to the glacier in fine form and with a surplus of food but for the astonishing failure of the men whom we had least expected to fail. Seaman Evans was thought to be the strongest man of the party, and Beardmore Glacier is not difficult in fine weather, but on our return we did not get a single completely fine day. This, with a sick companion, enormously increased our anxieties. I have said elsewhere that we got into frightfully rough ice and Edgar Evans received a concussion of the brain. He died a natural death, but left us a shaken party, with the season unduly advanced. But all the facts above enumerated were as nothing to the surprise which awaited us at the barrier. I maintain that our arrangements for returning were quite adequate, and that no one in the world would have done better in the weather which we encountered at this time of the year. On the summit, in latitude 82 degrees to 86 degrees, we had minus twenty to minus thirty. On the barrier, in latitude eighty-two degrees, ten thousand feet lower, we had minus thirty in the day, and minus forty-seven at night, pretty regularly, with a continuous headwind during our day marches. These circumstances came on very suddenly, and our wreck is certainly due to this sudden advent of severe weather, which does not seem to have any satisfactory cause. I do not think human beings ever came through such a month as we have come through, and we should have got through in spite of the weather, but for the sickening of a second companion, Captain Oates, and the shortage of fuel in our depots, for which I cannot account, and finally, but for the storm which had fallen on us within eleven miles of the depot, at which we hoped to secure the final supplies. Surely misfortune could scarcely have exceeded this last blow. 
we arrived within eleven miles of our old one-ton camp with fuel for one hot meal and food for two days for four days we have been unable to leave the tent the gale blowing about us we are weak writing is difficult but for my own sake i do not regret this journey which has shown that englishmen can endure hardships help one another and meet death with as great a fortitude as ever in the past we took risks we knew we took them things have come out against us and therefore we have no cause for complaint but bow to the will of providence determined still to do our best to the last but if we have been willing to give our lives to this enterprise which is for the honour of our country i appeal to our countrymen to see that those who depend on us are properly cared for had we lived i should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood endurance and courage of my companions which would have stirred the heart of every englishman these rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale but surely surely a great rich country like ours will see that those who are dependent on us are properly provided for signed r scott march twenty fifth nineteen twelve end of section one hundred and eleven end of the world story a history of the world in story song and art volume eight norway sweden denmark iceland greenland and the search for the poles edited by eva march tappan